Keelan, good morning. Can you go ahead and start the recording, please? Recording in progress. Colleagues, we have one free gavel item this morning. The city of Portland would like to take a moment to recognize and extend our condolences to the First Nation communities affected by the discovery of an unmarked mass grave containing 215 children at a former government residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. This news is traumatic and it's heartbreaking. It's another stark reminder of the vicious treatment that Native Americans here in the United States and First Nations people in Canada have been subjected to for generations. Residential schools were established with the sole purpose of performing systematic erasure of indigenous culture, spirituality, ideology, and tradition. This is a form of genocide. I want to also acknowledge Native Portlanders who have in some form or another been subjected to the trauma of being a boarding school survivor or a descendant of a survivor. The lessons we learn from the treatment of indigenous communities should inform how we rectify these injustices across the nation. And that includes right here in the city of Portland. Grieving this insurmountable loss will take time. It's my hope that the reunification of all 215 children to their loved ones is the first step of many in the healing and reconciliation process. The hurt we feel today is inevitable and it's invaluable in our reflections and it will inform how we act in addressing the darkest aspects of our history. I'd like to open the floor for commissioners who'd like to share brief remarks on this tragedy before we take a moment of silence. Commissioner Maps and Commissioner Rubio. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, colleagues. I am glad that we are taking this moment today um, to come together to share our grief and horror at the news that a mass grave containing the remains of 215 native children was discovered last week up in British Columbia on the grounds of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. The Kamloops Indian Residential School operated between 1890 and 1969. For decades, most indigenous children in Canada were taken from their families and forced into boarding schools like the one in Kamloops. The purpose of schools like these was to erase native Canadian culture. Indigenous Canadian children at residential schools were forbidden from speaking their native languages and forced to convert to Christianity. They lost touch with their customs and their parents. Many of these children never returned to their families. And today we know why those kids never came home. Physical abuse and neglect at the Kamloops Indian Residential School were rampant. The mass grave containing the bodies of more than 200 children, some as young as three years old, is a grim reminder of the suffering endured by Native children who were sent to residential schools. On this day, we should remember and honor those kids. And on this day, we should also remember that Indian boarding schools are not unique to Canada. We have had them here in the United States too. In fact, the first Indian boarding school in the United States opened up in 1860 on the Yakima Indian Reservation, which today is just a three hours drive away from Portland. More than 300 Indian boarding schools were opened in the United States. Eight of those schools were established here in Portland. The goal of the American Indian boarding schools was to assimilate Indian tribes into the American way of life. Like in Canada, Native American children in boarding schools were separated from their parents and forbidden from speaking their native languages. The explicit and misguided philosophy behind the Native American boarding school movement was this. Kill the Indian, save the man. Now, today, Americans spend a lot of time debating what is and is not institutional racism. But I think that we can all agree that the Indian boarding school movement was a clear example of institutional racism. The whole point of those educational institutions was to destroy indigenous culture and indigenous communities. 
Americans, America's Indian boarding schools were ruthlessly efficient at that project. In fact, today here in Portland, we still live with the wounds caused by our ancestors' genocidal wars against Amer Native American communities. For example, today here in Portland, poverty rates amongst Native Americans are triple the rates of their white neighbors. Also, more than 20% of Portland's Native American community experiences hunger on a monthly basis. Further, today, the average Native American family in Portland can only afford to rent a two-bedroom apartment in just four of Portland's 95 neighborhoods. And to bring it full circle, back to the theme of Native American education, today in Portland, about half of our Native American high schoolers fail to graduate. Those grim statistics caused me to think back on Faulkner's famous quote, the past is never dead. It's not even past. We are not even 100 years removed from the end of the Indian Wars. So it should come as no surprise that there is much healing left to be done. This council can and must promote healing in Portland's Native American community by creating better and fairer public policy. We can do that by honoring tribal sovereignty and by delivering the services that Native Portlanders need in order to thrive and prosper. But today I wanna to set aside those policy discussions. Today, I wanna to appreciate this opportunity to share this moment of silence and grief with everyone who is mourning the children buried on the grounds of the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Rubio, good morning. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my heart broke when I first heard about this. Um, it's an unfathomable, unfathomable horror that something of this magnitude would have gone unnoticed and unaccountable for so many decades. And I thought of the children in my life um, in our community and they're precious and deserve unconditional love, respect and not violence or harm. Everything we do today is in an effort to do best by our children. But what happened at this residential school and at others across Canada and the United States represents not seeing indigenous children as people and we're stripping them of their families, tradition and humanity. The forced removal of Indigenous children from their families was a government-funded attempt to eradicate Indigenous culture and identity. We in Oregon have more than our fair share in a long history of displacement, attempted genocide, colonization, and slavery, including one of the oldest Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding schools, Chimawa. It's our responsibility to acknowledge the trauma that these schools have inflicted on Native children and their families for generations. This hits close to home as there are many survivors and descendants that live in Portland. Our own tribal relations director, Laura John's grandfather was sent to Chamawa and she is a descendant of relatives who were sent to the very first boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania in the late 1800s. We must recognize and reconcile that our country and our state have flourished and prospered through the murder, exploitation and erasure of the first people of this land and the systemic subjugation of tribal nations that have existed here since time immemorial. It is our duty to bring truth and reconciliation to this and to the many other ways in which communities of color have been disenfranchised, oppressed, and prohibited from living a life of prosperity based on the color of their skin and the origin of their culture. As a city, something tangible we can do is to educate ourselves. My office will reach out to other council offices and Laura John and her tribal relations team about potential opportunities. And we'll also reach out to the indigenous community of Portland. Whatever I accomplish or do, do not do in my time, or do in my time as serving in Portland, I want no one in the future to look back and find us turning a blind eye to the humanity of our community members. We must never ever lose sight of that goal because in losing sight of that goal, we lose it all. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Ryan, good morning. Good morning, and thank you, Mayor Wheeler, Director John, and also to my colleagues who've already spoken. Uh, beautiful words have been spoken. Anyway, making us all aware of this tragedy and for allowing us to have time to honor the lives of First Nations children, but also the opportunity to honor and stand in solidarity 
with our Native sisters and brothers who are most affected by these findings and the impacts of colonization. News of these findings affect trauma among Indigenous communities here in Oregon. Just in 2016, numerous unmarked graves were reported to have been found at the school that Commissioner Rubio mentioned, Chamawa Indian School Cemetery. It's presumed the young children suffered from epidemics in their dormitories. We sit in the pain of these acts of genocide and erasure have caused, and we're determined to work internally and across government aisles to atone the hurt and exploitation that our indigenous communities have endured. I look forward to working with my colleagues and thank you for your remarks, Commissioner Rubio, about the steps you've already taken. I'm all in. And thank you again for allowing us to have a pre capital moment of silence. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Commissioner Hardesty, good morning. Good morning, Mayor. Uh, good morning, Council colleagues. Um, thank you all for your really heartfelt words. Commissioner Maps, you outdid yourself this morning. Um, I was very grateful for your very detailed history. Um, when governments create policies to annihilate populations of people, um, we say that it was it is it is policy. Um, it is us, the people, that get to make the policy. It is not for 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 a foregone conclusion. When you think about the Indian Civilization Act Fund created on March 3rd, 1819, and the peace policy of the 1869 of the United States of America, these two things worked in concert to try to annihilate a culture of our first people. Um, I have met so many natives who today don't know their native tongue because of what we, the United States government did to their families and their ancestors. Um, and so there is a lot of healing. I so appreciate Commissioner Rubio talking about creating opportunities and spaces for healing uh, collectively. There's a lot of healing that must happen. And um, I am grateful uh, to serve on a council with people who will take the time to acknowledge other people's pain caused by our government. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. We will now take a moment of silence to honor the 215 children who are victim to this mass grave and to their families. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. All right, Keelan, good morning. This is the Wednesday, June 9th, 2021 morning session of the Portland City Council. We're now in session. Please call the roll. Good morning. Ryan. Here. Hardesty. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Wheeler. Here. Uh, and Megan, is that you? I can't see you, but it sounds like it's you. Yes, it's me today. All right. Just good. for the Thank morning. You. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. It's uh, good to hear your voice. Thank you. Under Portland City Code and State Law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronically. All members of the Council are attending remotely by video and teleconference, and the City has made several avenues available to the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. The meeting is available to the public on the city's YouTube channel, eGovPDX, www.portlandoregon.gov slash video and channel 30. The public can also provide written testimony to the council by emailing the council clerk at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. The council is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and to promote physical distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all again for your patience, your understanding, and your flexibility as we manage through these challenges to conduct the city's business. With that, we'll hear from 
legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Lori, is that you today? It is. Excellent. Good morning. morning. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions for the first readings of ordinances. The published council agenda at portlandoregon.gov backslash auditor contains information about how and when you may sign up for testimony while the city council is holding electronic meetings. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify them. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When your time is up, the presiding officer will ask you to conclude. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony. When your time is up, we're interrupting your testimony. I'm so sorry. Uh, or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in person being placed on hold or ejected from the rain, remainder of the electronic meeting. Please be aware that all council meetings are recorded. Phew. Okay. Well, I got to say, Lori, that was, that was beautiful multitasking there. Well done. Thank you for that. Uh, Megan, first up is communications, please. Item 421, the first individual. Request of Serena Keen to address council regarding a more efficient way to deal with potholes. Good morning. Oh, it looks like she may have just fallen off of right, Zoom, cool. but I know that they're here. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll just put her in the rotation a little bit uh, uh, after the next individual, please. 422, please. And actually, um, the first three items are going to be that group uh, together. So if you're okay, we'll do 424 first. Yes, yeah, well, that's fine. That works. Thank you. Request of Angie Garcia to address council regarding the safety of an early childhood program. Good morning, Angie. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler, esteemed city commissioners. I thank you for your time and attention this morning. My name is Angie Garcia, and I'm a small business owner with two early childhood programs here in Portland called Escuela Viva. I'm here today with one question that has two parts. First, what needs to happen so preschools and daycares can be included as school zones so that we can request lower speeds and drug-free zones around our facilities? Second, what can we do to create camping-free zones around schools and early childhood programs? I pose these two questions as the owner of two preschools. One of these preschools is in the Central Eastside Industrial District, the only preschool in the district. We have been on the corner of 11th and Pine for more than 10 years. We love our neighborhood and have worked hard to be compassionate neighbors. Our children have donated since year one winter clothing for the St. Francis Dining Hall. Over the years, it has been a bit of a roller coaster. I've worked diligently to get the attention of three city administrations, and it was not until the formation of the Enhanced Services District, the Eastside Together program, that we have actually seen some real progress in our neighborhood. That being said, there have been very few weeks where we have not seen weekly and sometimes daily violence in our neighborhood. Members of our school community have been assaulted. We have been verbally attacked, items stolen, and spend way too much time on the phone to police concerned for the safety of the children in our care and our houseless neighbors. We conduct daily patrols around the school property to ensure there is not drug paraphernalia, human waste, and other dangers for children. I have to talk to neighbors who threaten one another with violence, yell obscenities, pull their pants down, and defecate with children, where the children can see them. Just yesterday, the police were called because a woman was struggling. She was completely naked, verbally assaulting passerbys, and we were concerned for her safety as well as our school community. Yet, we are part of the neighborhood. We have, been, we have done more than our part to ensure that the area around our school is safe. My staff and parents have conducted safety patrols during pickup and drop off times. I put in security cameras, additional outdoor lighting, and recently partnered with St. Francis to add security during pickup and drop offs. All of this has occurred during the pandemic when we have struggled financially. We can do no more. We employ the city here today to partner with us. We are not asking you to fix this alone, we're asking you to do your part. Help us work through the bureaucracies. 
help us to partner with the state to create these camp-free zones around schools. We do not want to be part of shuffling our houseless neighbors to different parts of the city. Yet, everyone must follow rules and have clear consequences. There is no reason for those struggling with houselessness to be camping where children go to school. Not because children should be sheltered from the harsh realities of life. My preschoolers see it every day. Yet teachers and administrators should be able to focus on teaching our youngest community members and not have to manage the challenges our, that face our houseless neighbors. Let our teachers do what they are trained to do, teach. My ask is specific, to not sit before me nodding your heads in agreement, nor to tell me how you understand our struggles. We are simply asking that someone be assigned to the task of partnering with us to take on this actionable task. My ask is here on record. I have shared all that we have done as a school community, and we are asking for your help. Please do not wait until a child is hurt, especially when there is something specific that we can all do. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Um, I just want to thank Angie for her testimony. I used to live about two blocks from your facility at a time when my kids were um, quite young. Um, everything you have described, I have seen with my own eyes. Um, I'd love to work with you about uh, finding solutions for this. So uh, if you reach out to my office, I'll get a staffer engaged in a dialogue with you. I absolutely appreciate you. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Angie, uh, there is no subject that I get more email, text messages, calls, letters. Um, uh, I, I went to the gym this morning and somebody came up to me at the gym. There, there's no subject more difficult than this one. The question of the homeless crisis in our city, uh, acknowledging that there are many people who are vulnerable on the streets, as well as acknowledging that there's a significant impact to the community at large. and. You specifically said you don't want me to say I understand, so I will not tell you that. Um, however, I will promise you that help is on the way. Commissioner Hardison. I don't know if Angie dropped off. I don't know what happened there. No, I'm still here. Oh, okay. I'm still here. Were you able to hear what I said? I did. I did. Okay. I heard you and, and I appreciate you. Um, are, oh, like you. Commissioner Mapes, are you willing to tax, tax someone from your office specifically that will partner with us while we try and work through some of these issues? Uh, the, the commissioner committed that if you'll get in touch with him, he will follow up. So if you follow up with Commissioner Maps, he'd be happy to do that. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I had some minor technology issues uh, a moment ago. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Angie, for your testimony. Um, and also thank you for working with the Enhanced Service District. The one on the east side is, in fact, a model, I believe, of how community can work with our houseless community members uh, to help make our community better. Um, Angie, uh, as you well know, and, and you really articulated it well, during this pandemic, there's been a lot of economic devastation in our city. Um, I will never support banning places where people can camp until we have enough safe, affordable housing places that people can live in. As Commissioner Mapp said earlier, the only four neighborhoods that our indigenous population can afford to live without being cost burdened. And for African Americans, there's not one zip, there's not one neighborhood that African Americans live in that they are not cost burden. So as a city, we have a lot of work to do, but I want to be straight with you. I will not ban people from being anywhere until we have the resources they need uh, to help them uh, stabilize their lives. So I have a question for you, Commissioner Hardesty. Would your would you hey, I'm happy to have a conversation with you if you'll reach out to my office. This is not the time for us to have that conversation. So, Angie, let, okay. me, let me just say this. The, the council is not unified on this subject. Um, I support your position. I personally believe that there are places in the city where camping is not acceptable. And I would put at the top of that list anywhere near our schools. However, as Commissioner Hardesty just indicated, um, she has a, um, uh, she has good reasons uh, and values that she espouses that are different. So this is, a, this is a debate we are having internally as the city council and as you know, the community at large is also having this debate. 
but I know this council is committed to finding a path that will ensure that not only are we addressing the needs of the most vulnerable on our streets, but that we are also protecting the rights and the interests of everybody else in the community. And that's where I am, and that's where I expect to go in the near future. Yeah, I think that the challenge is, if I can just have 30 more seconds, is that this is a, an and situation. The houselessness do have rights, and they have a right to to freedom, just like the rest of us, to, to health and well and, and happiness and wellness. And that should not be at the expense of the safety and well-being of children. If if the person who assaulted my staff person and also assaulted a parent had actually hurt a child, I wonder if your position might be different to Commissioner Hardesty. I'm not saying that we don't that that the houses should not be camping because they don't have anywhere else to go. But there should be certain places where they're not allowed to do that because we we do have certain individuals that we have to protect that cannot protect themselves. And those are our children. So I thank you for your time. I realize we may not we may not um, be on the same position of, as, as this uh, Commissioner Hardesty, but I hope that you will hear my words and hear that I have a job to do, and that is to protect the children in my care and um, I will continue to fight to do so. Thank you. Thank you, and, and so you'll follow up with Commissioner Maps then. I absolutely will, thank oh, you. Great. great, and thank you Commissioner Maps for that. Uh, good conversation, everybody. Uh, so uh, Megan, do we have, uh, uh, is Serena on the line? Yes, we do. Okay, Would so you like me to read that? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and go back to 421. Thank you. Request of Serena Keen to address council regarding a more efficient way to deal with potholes. Ah, good morning. Serena, are you there? there. Yeah, sorry. Oh, there you are. Oh, there you are. Uh, Serena's absent today, uh, but uh, me, Lauren, and Julian are here to present in her place. So, uh, hello, we are eighth graders at uh, Gogi Middle School. Our names are, as previously stated, I'm Lauren, and he's- I'm Julian. Um, and we are hoping to spread further awareness to the Portland potholes problem. Portland uh, pothole problem. Portland is full of bikers and drivers, but this having safe streets is very important. And potholes are a continual danger. Danger. There are accounts of injuries at the hands of potholes, and according to bike by Portland.org, uh, Oregon pothole crash uh, crash injuries go from scrapes to brain damage, and these are potholes that have previously been reported. Potholes are a problem everywhere and have been forever. In fact, there is an estimated uh, amount of five, 55 million potholes in the US at the current, meaning plenty of people to fall, to fall victim to potholes. Um, and according to pothole.info, over 3,000 are injured every year after coming across a pothole. Not only are people hurt, but, car, uh, but damage to cars is very spendy and excessive. Pothole, pothole damage, uh, uh, pothole damages wheels, steering, suspension, and alignment systems. These these damages can cost from two hundred fifty dollars to a thousand. And according to InsuranceJournal.com, a new and I quote: a new study from the American Automobile Association (AAA) reveals that, reveals that pothole damage has cost uh, the U.S. Dri U.S. drivers fifteen billion in vehicle repairs over the last five years. Are, are about $3 billion uh, annually. This is a problem because many people who live in Portland do not have enough money to spare for the extensive consequences, for the extensive consequences um, of pothole damage. Now let's talk about what is, go what is being done at the current. People do not know that piles must be reported in order for them to be filled up. There are also people that are part of this organization, Department of Transportation, that are driving around and reporting piles themselves. This is a map as shown on the screen of the piles that have been reported and have been noted down. As you can see, the reported piles that have not been fixed are in red and the fixed ones are in green. In order to further improve the current pothole situation, we came up with a small and cheap solution. We decided the most realistic course of action is to spread further awareness to the current course of action in the reporting system. So when coming across a pothole, people know that to report it to the city's transportation government and share the message. We can do this by making posters or visible using billboards. 
It would make the government's currently efficient way of fixing reported potholes more popular and as useful if people knew their part in repairing the roads. Reports pressure the government to fix potholes faster since so many people are reporting the same one. Not many people currently know that they can report potholes, so potholes go unnoticed. If people report potholes, it would create an overall bigger urgency to the pothole solution and give a little bit more credit to the government. Again, not many people knew that the government won't, can't fix without them being reported. Uh, we hope they can support, they, they can support this. Um, we, we hope they can support this in the future. Thank you. Thank you both. I believe the information commissioner would like to acknowledge what you've said for a minute. Commissioner. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you very much. Clearly you've done your research uh, nationally around potholes and the impact of potholes on individual automobile owners. And I wanna greatly appreciate the work that you've done. Um, I don't know if you've actually looked at uh, the city's backlog of maintenance on our city streets. Did you get a chance to actually dive into the city of Portland's uh, Department of Transportation data? Yes, um, they said that they that it takes about a week for them to be reported. Like once they report it, it takes about a week for them to be fixed. And sometimes they're not fixed as seen on the map. And um, we would like to encourage them to start fixing more that are reported. Yeah, I would like to encourage them to fix more too. But the challenge is we have a limited budget, right? And so when you are in, uh, when you have a limited budget, uh, there are just some things you have to delay. Um, I, and so I just want you to know, I appreciate your research and your research with my budget information. Maybe you can help me figure out how we pay for uh, pothole repairs uh, uh, more efficiently. So keep doing your research. I'd love to continue this conversation at a later date. Please reach out to my office um, and let's see if we can develop a project that your class can measure on whether or not we're actually doing a better job. Right, you know, thank you. There's a lot of potholes. And if you get off the main street in East Portland, mm -hmm. there's nothing but potholes that you are trying to avert, right? And on a bike, that's not much fun either. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, reach out to my office. Let's see if we can continue this conversation. Excellent. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank Commissioner you. Hershey. Don't, don't go away yet. Don't go away yet. Commissioner Maps has a, has a, a comment or a question. Commissioner Maps. Uh, sure. I just wanted to take a moment to express my gratitude to, um, the, the, for the testimony that we got uh, this afternoon. Um, I, I learned a lot from that presentation, and I really applaud you for digging into an important public problem. And I hope that you stay engaged with the challenge of making Portland a better city. So thank you, and I look forward to your next testimony before this council. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Uh, so is, is this part of a school project? Yeah. And, and I'm sorry, you said what school, and I, I didn't hear what school. Uh, it's uh, Gilkey Middle School. Ah, excellent. I, I'm well familiar with Gilkey Middle School, of course. Um, so I think this is a great project. You did your research. Uh, you are the first people today to be able to actually work Zoom the way it's supposed to work with the shared screen. So kudos for that as well. Uh, the graphic you used was very effective. You chose your graphic wisely. And I like the way that you shared the back and forth in this presentation. And as Commissioner Maps indicated, you've educated us. You provided some information I wasn't aware of, and I've been on the city council for a little while. Um, and so a presentation where you, you give us new information like that is tremendously helpful. Um, so thank you both for that. And you should absolutely take Commissioner Hardesty up on her offer to reach out to her office uh, because she, as the transportation commissioner, is the one who can really put these ideas into motion. And so uh, I just want to thank you for the great work you're doing and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you for your okay, time. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Say hi to your teachers too, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Megan, next individual, I believe, is uh, 422, Max. Request of Max Cooper to address council regarding safe sidewalks. 
Hey, Max. Hey. Can you all introduce yourselves, please, for the record? Yeah. Good morning, Portland City Council, and welcome to our testimony. My name is Amalka Wojtowska. My name is Ryan Turner. I'm Max Cooper. And my name is Simone Westmeyer. We are all eighth graders at Gilkey Middle School. And today we are here to present to you the problem, which is the safety concern due to the lack of the sidewalk near our school. The sidewalk is missing from the ending of Northwest Miller Road through the corner and then continues on to Northwest Cornell Road. Every day on their way to school, students are walking on the side of the busy road, having to walk next to big bushes on one side and ongoing traffic from the other. The little walking space on the narrow path makes it hard for other pedestrians to pass by and lack of space may cause the necessity to walk on the road. As well as that, students are less visible to ongoing traffic, which creates an unsafe situation. We talked to our head of, new head of school, Scott Hardister, who joined us last year. He said he would be interested in pursuing student safety and encouraging the sooner construction of a sidewalk in that area. In addition to that, we interviewed both Michelle Marks, who was in charge of Head PDX, as well as Carol Sheshriak, who was the president of the Forest Park Neighborhood Group, who gave us the suggestions of what we should try to work towards, from which we developed our proposal. To understand our proposal, proposal of the sidewalk safety concern, you need a small understanding of how Head PDX decides where Portland needs the construction of sidewalks. Each proposed walkway is assigned a tier, where the areas in Tier 1 are the first priority, and the areas in Tier 5 are the last to be achieved. Currently, the corner of, corner of Cornell and Miller is placed in Tier 5, meaning it will be one of the last places to be paved. We propose that the corner of Cornell and Miller be put higher on the priority list so the sidewalk is built sooner and has seen more of a problem than what paper would show you. Why is boosting the area into a tier to be paid faster a good solution? For the sake of student safety, we believe the sidewalk on the corner of Northwest Cornell Road and Northwest Miller Road should be paid faster. As with this occurrence, the probability of a potential hazard rises the longer we wait. According to, the, to our plan, it will not be necessary for anybody to go out of their way to accomplish this plan. There will be no increase of budget, but safety will be assured uh, sooner. We hope you take our proposal into consideration to, pro to prom promote student safety in Portland. Thank you for listening, and we hope we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hardesty has a comment. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, thank you again. Apparently, transportation has been on the education agenda this year at your school. Um, I have a question for you. Um, and as the transportation commissioner, I'm always intrigued when people say, move us up on a list, and it won't cost you a penny. How do I get to move you up? on the list and it not cost me money as the commissioner in charge of transportation. How does that work? Um, okay, well, I guess so. It will cost you money, of course, to pay the sidewalk, obviously. Um, oh, but, so it will, okay. Yeah, but we're our goal is to try um, to move it higher on the priority. Um, so it'll be done sooner. Um, we're not asking uh, for just a new sidewalk to be put in place since it is planned to be built. So the budget will not go up. It'll just be prioritized uh, higher on the list. Okay, I understand that better now. And so um, the priority one areas, I believe are areas that we call high crash areas where we have experienced a lot of death of community members um, at the hands of automobiles, right? So my job as the commissioner is to put any dollars I can find first into those areas that people are dying. And that's been my priority. I am happy to look at your research and talk about what other things we can do to mitigate the challenges that you talked about. Maybe we can't move up the sidewalk, but maybe there are other things that we could do that would be safety improvements um, uh, while we're waiting for the resources to be able to upgrade the sidewalk. I'm happy to have that conversation as well. 
uh, you guys have inspired me this morning. You did really excellent research. And um, I got to tell you, for eighth graders to be that well-spoken at city council kind of boggles the mind because uh, that's not, we don't, we don't normally get eighth graders that are so well-organized, so well-researched, and so clear about what they're asking. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. And please reach out to my office so we can continue this conversation. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. And what you don't know is they could have given this presentation in fluent French if they'd wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it's like that, is it? Very Absolutely. Cool. Commissioner Mass. Um, and I just wanted to thank this group for their presentation, too. Uh, um, I also want to say that they, you have convinced me. I do think that uh, building sidewalks closer to schools should be a top priority. Um, you know, I, I always thought it's, it's a little bit crazy that our schools have things called safe routes to schools, which are the official walking paths that you're supposed to take in order to get your kids to school. But I'll tell you, um, in so many neighborhoods around Portland, uh, um, those safe routes to schools are not safe at all. Um, in your neighborhood, Neighborhood, and I know, especially out in East Portland, uh, those safe routes to schools are actually uh, um, uh, just uh, unpaved paths along the side of the road. It scares me to death as a as a as a, a parent of, t of two young kids who walk to school. Um, this is something I actually, I tell you the truth, this is something I've worked on in the past, and. Um, it's a real challenge to move things uh, uh, forward. As Commissioner Hardesty says, we have lots of competing uh, uh, um, demands, especially around building sidewalks. Uh, but I really encourage you to stick with this. I tell you, uh, one of my personal goals as a public servant here in Portland is to do everything I can to build sidewalks um, all the way out to the edges of our city limits. And I think when I get when I get that done, that'll be the day when I can retire and feel like I've accomplished something. Uh, and I may not get there, but I hope you uh, folks can help us get there as a community. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Hardesty, did you have your hand raised again? No. Uh, all right, kids, thank you. Great project. Well done. You made a very compelling case. I, I'm also compelled by it, uh, but maybe I'm a little biased as well. So thank you for the project. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I believe 423 is next, Megan. Request of Kyle Nagori to address council regarding kids not leaving their rooms or going outside. All right, this one's going to be interesting. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, my name is Kyle. My name is Ryder. My name is Kais, and we are students at Gilpie International School. The problem we have in our current generation is that kids are staying in the room all day, especially on the weekends. They would play video games or talk to their friends, and they would never leave their house or room. This is a huge problem because it can be very unhealthy and it is important to hang out with family and friends in real life and not online. The world needs to change to a place where teenagers are playing outside with their friends and are running under the sun so the kids don't experience the unhealthy symptoms of the lack of going outside. Not leaving your room and looking at screens all day can be horrible because of many different reasons. My vitamin D loss is a severe problem that can cause loss of bone density. Some more common symptoms of lack of vitamin D include tiredness, muscle pain, anxiety, low energy, bad mood, and frequent illnesses. These common symptoms are not severe and can happen through a, only a small lack of vitamin D. To put this into scale, 1 billion people out of over 7 billion people have lack of vitamin D. Vitamin D is not the only problem of staying in your room all day. The other main problem is that teenagers aren't just stuck in their room, but also they are staring at their screens. Staring at a screen for a long period of time without breaks can cause, can cause less blinking over time. This can cause bad eyesight and nearsightedness. The solution we thought of will, will be to give kids prizes for working out a specific amount of time over the summer. They will keep track of the amount of time exercised on an app that calculates amount of calories burned. Every specific amount of calories burned, the child can spin a virtual wheel that will give a chance of winning a prize. It can be a grand prize or a small prize. I think it would encourage kids to go outside so they can collect the prizes. Since there are many kids with different ages like that like different things, it might be smarter to make sure the prizes will be enjoyed by all kids with different age groups. Older kids might prefer gift cards and video games, while younger kids might prefer, prefer toys or board games. This will be an event that will be hosted at a community center. 
to get the prizes, they will go pick it up at the community center. Another possibility will be for the prizes to be shipped. This will be a completely free program that the government will pay for, making it easier for the parents to participate. For reference, the summer reading program where kids can get prizes for reading cost around $150,000 for just the Multnomah County annually. And the way we planned it will make it much cheaper than $150,000. We thought this would work for a reward system is the best solution, since it would be involving for bored kids in the summer who are attracted to prizes. It promotes the general welfare of the communities by giving them a healthier life. The parents would support the idea because instead of parents having to motivate their kids and go outside and play, they would do it by themselves. It is also a completely free program to enter. We hope you will consider our proposal that will definitely make a future for America healthier. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. I, I think this is a great idea. Um, anything that gets teenagers out of their room and away from the screen is probably good bang for the buck. And, and the three of you know from your research, the while there is a cost to this program that, that you have suggested, I believe you suggested $150,000, uh, you have to weigh that against the cost to society in terms of health care and mental health uh, afflictions that can arise from people being shut in. As you know, during this last year, during COVID, when we've all been stuck inside, and I, I was sort of ticking off all the symptoms that, that you were mentioning, uh, from, from grumpy to not feeling particularly well, to lack of sleep, to stress, to everything else, we're all feeling that. And there's a cost to society to that too. So I, I think this is a really cool and innovative approach, and I appreciate your sharing that with us and the rest of the city this morning. Commissioner Maps and then Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks to this panel for that presentation. This topic speaks to my heart. Um, I live with a 10-year-old boy and a 12-year-old boy. We have been pretty much locked in this house for the past 14 months. There have been special, some special things about this, but um, there have actually been some um, damage, as you, I think, uh, point out. I can see in my own kids, um, they're... they're they've kind of forgotten how to engage with the world for um, a little bit. And, and certainly at this summer, as we move to the post-COVID era, um, one of the things that we're trying to do as a family is to re-engage with our friends and neighbors. Um, as a dad who spends a lot of time on Zoom, I can't wait to get these guys out of the house and down to the uh, parks. Uh, um, I love your idea about how, uh, about how to incentivize uh, getting kids to um, get outside and be healthy. Um, I'd love to see if we can implement it. Um, but I also want to point out that uh, under the leadership of Commissioner Rubio, uh, the Parks Bureau will be open and offering uh, many, many recreational opportunities uh, this summer. So I um, hope that um, everyone who is trying to get their kid out of the house or every kid who's tired of uh, playing uh, Fortnite uh, will check out the offerings uh, um, happening down at your local park. I know uh, there's a lot of great stuff going on. And um, um, again, thank you for the presentation. I hope that this is not the last time that you come to speak before this uh, city council. You are always welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Hurst. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you, uh, students. Um, I was chuckling when one of you said, and then we'll get the government to pay for it because it'll be free. And I, I'm just wondering, do you know where government gets this money? Taxes, I guess. Mm hmm Taxes and feeds and services, right? Yeah. And do you yeah. know who government uh, makes pay those taxes, feeds, and services? Civilians. You got it. And so there's no such thing as free money at, 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 in government, right? Because government is supposed to collect money and use that money for the collective good, right? So government's job is to do things that individually you couldn't do yourself. So like the last group that talked about the sidewalk, right? You could, wouldn't be able to go out and patch your own uh, sidewalk if in fact something happened to it, right? So I just didn't want you to uh, uh, think that uh, we had this uh, secret vault that we just go in the back room and open up uh, for these kind of projects. So thank you yeah. very much for your excellent research. Um, and I and I absolutely agree 100% that we must get young people outside, and I would say old people too, 
uh, so that we can uh, enjoy the sun and the fresh air and just being among people again. I can tell you for myself, only twice have I been out among people uh, uh, in the last 15 months. And both times it was like a shot of adrenaline, right? Just to be around other people. And so um, I hope this summer will be safe enough for us to continue to safely open and for young people to be able to have that experience. As you were speaking, I thought this would be a great presentation for Sports Oregon, um, who came in and did a fabulous presentation to us a few weeks back about how they invest in young people's physical health. So I would encourage you to reach out to that organization and make the same presentation. And I suspect they take you on a road show with them uh, as they uh, go around raising resources. So thank you very much for being here and look forward to your next appearance in front of city council. Thank you. Good thank job. you. Good job, all of you. And, and congratulations to everyone at the Gilkey School. You did terrifically well today. Thank you. Megan, the last person, if I kept my space properly here, uh, it's item number 425, is that correct? Yes. All right. Request of Andy Thompson to address council regarding policy change for political organizations hiring of private security. Good morning, Andy. Thank you for your patience. Good morning. Thank you for granting me space on the agenda. I'm speaking to you today from the unceded lands of indigenous communities whose traditional lands run along the Columbia River, and I appreciate that the council acknowledged the trauma of settler colonialism at the start of this meeting today. Uh, so I'd like to share a story with you. <laughs> I recently had a strange situation play out in my neighborhood. A church on my block was rented by the Multnomah County Republican Party to host a recall vote of their then chairman. And for this event, they hired a group of Proud Boys out of Oregon City to patrol our neighborhood against a threat of an imagined disruption by an Antifa boogeyman. This meant that our neighborhood block had anti-democratic authoritarian paramilitary group stationed on all corners, patrolling back and forth for several hours on an otherwise uneventful weekday night. While on our block, myself and other neighbors watching in discomfort observed these men intentionally intimidating the residents, taking photos of homes with BLM signs, stickering, and by the end of the night becoming intoxicated and in some cases belligerent including a bizarre display at the end of the event where one man who had forgotten his coat wrapped himself in a comforter blanket before escorting elderly meeting attendees back to their vehicles. A police presence came for a short time, but could do nothing on behalf of the community since the men had a security contract giving them a legal right to be present and that some, some of the members had certificates authenticating them as volunteer security. From doing a bit of background research, it appears that hiring such groups has been a common practice for the county's Republican Party since Trump's inauguration in 2017. And just last week, they repeated the practice of renting a church located in a community neighborhood and hired the Proud Boys to again perform some kind of service on behalf of a subset of the party, this time in Gresham. As both a Portlander and a social scientist with a vested interest in understanding how city processes shape the lived urban experience, I would like to see this unsettling practice come to an end the practice of an official political party legitimizing an anti-democratic paramilitary group known to seek violence by bringing them into neighborhoods to patrol our streets at their discretion. In an effort to follow up on the possibilities of preventing this pattern from becoming normalized in neighborhoods, I've considered the following. A complaint could be filed with the Oregon Department of Public Safety Standards and Training. However, if they investigate, their policy is to give copies of our statements and personal information to the party the complaint was about, in this case, the Proud Boys. If we pursue a legislative angle to change regulations stating how volunteer security can be done, we risk impacting the future of security at nonprofit arts and music events in Portland. It seems to be a wicked problem, one where solutions may do as much harm as good, and I'm hoping that there's a better solution to this community safety concern and that the council might have some thoughts on how to achieve this. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. We appreciate your being here and sharing that. Uh, Commissioner Hartz. Um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you uh, for that very troubling testimony. Um, uh, it's not the first time I've heard of armed uh, um, security um, uh, coming into neighborhoods and actually um, intimidating uh, community members um, by, simply by their presence 
honestly. Um, and, and then some of them, as you've noted, uh, become aggressive. And, and I just have to say, honestly, I don't know what the law is around what's what is and isn't uh, legal, um, but I can commit that I can do some research to find out. I know I've had a similar conversation with our DA, Mike Smith, um, and I've also heard that the police say they can do nothing because people have either concealed weapons permits that I'm not sure they check to determine whether they do or not. Um, so I do think that you raise a very um, timely question um, that um, deserves us to uh, dig into more. So I will commit to doing some research and letting you know what I find. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hardison. Uh, Megan, does that complete communications? I believe it does. Yes. All right, very good. Uh, on the consent agenda, have any items been pulled? Yes, items 432 and 436 have been requested to be pulled from the consent agenda by Edith Gillis. All right, very good. We'll take them up at the end of the regular agenda. Please call the roll on the remainder of the consent agenda. Ryan? Sorry about that. <laughs> um, we're doing the consent agenda right now. Yes. I know I wanted to say something. Usually I just say I, but um, I'm, I can't find my notes at the moment, but I can remember a little bit about what I want to say. It's real brief. I just want to thank the people um, who are renewing their three-year commitments for the draft board. It's a big time commitment. And for you all to sign up for another three years is really amazing. I don't think Portlanders realize how many volunteers we rely on to make this city work and improve. So I just want to say it was great to meet with all of you. And I vote aye. Hardesty? Aye. Maps? Aye. Rubio? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. Item 426, first time serving, please. Appoint and reappoint members to the Portland Parks and Recreation Board. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. The Parks and Recreation Advisory Board was established by Council in 20, 2001 uh, to ensure that the park system delivers on its mission to provide healthy parks and natural areas, urban forest management, recreation services, programming for residents of all ages, and facilities that are accessible to all Portlanders. This year, the nominating committee reviewed 46 applications and interviewed 17 of those candidates for just six positions. I want to thank our parks board members for their service in this. With so many ready applicants, it's really clear that your passion is contagious. Um, so now Director Long will share more about the recommended appointees. Um, it's, is Director Long on the call? Hi, this is Bonnie Geosic, and I have a link for this item, I think. I'm vice chair of the Parks Board. I don't know if Director Long was planning to be here. She's, she's oh, okay. on the call, uh, but I don't, she, she's both muted and has her video off, so I can't tell if she, she has a connection problem. Um, I have the information and was prepared to present it. If that would be helpful. Uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I was having some issues. My apologies. Um, Bonnie, thank you. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so thank you, Commissioner Rubio, and good morning, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. For the record, I am Adina Long, Director of Portland Parks and Recreation. As Commissioner Rubio stated, there was significant interest in our advisory board this year. There were many exceptional candidates and we're excited to recommend for appointment six members that add skills and experiences that help the board better reflect the makeup of the city. They include Dr. Adrian Feldstein, a physician, swim instructor with Portland Parks and Recreation, <coughs> landscape paint, painter and recent appointee to the Urban Forestry Commission. Allie Berman, the communications manager at Portland Audubon and board member for disabled hikers. Dr. C.N.E. Corbin, an assistant professor at PSU's School of Urban Studies and Planning and an Oakland Parks Foundation board member. 
Nova Newcomer, the executive director at Friends of Baseball and member of the Portland State Athletic Advisory Board and Multnomah Athletic Foundation Board. Elena Pertogini, legislative director for Governor Brown and Sabrina Wilson, the executive director at the Rosewood Initiative and former Parkey and Civic Life staff member. These appointees will replace three members of the board with terms ending on June 30, 2021 and three members who resigned prior to their terms completed. Adrian Feldstein will replace Jenny Glass who resigned in 2021 and complete their term that ends July, uh, June 30, 2022. Ali Berman and Corbin will replace Pune Abdelhosseini and Alejandra Cortez who resigned in 2021 and complete their terms that end June 30, 2023. Adrian, Ali, and Corbin will be eligible to serve two full terms after completing these partial term appointments. Nova newcomer, Elena Pertolgini and Sabrina Wilson will replace Ian Jacquis, Katie Holland and Tamara Layden with their first term ending on June 30, 2024 and the option to serve a second term. Two current members of the board, Bonnie Giosik and John Casey Mills are due for reappointment with terms ending June 30, 2024. Bonnie will be serving her second full term and Casey, who is completing a partial term appointment, will be serving his full first full term on the board. We know that this board's advocacy and collaboration will be important for the success of a sustainable future for parks. And we are looking forward to welcoming these community members joining the board this summer. We have submitted the report for these appointments and reappointments for your consideration and approval. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Um, so unless there's any questions, I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Hardesty moves. Can I get a second, please? Second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Megan, please call the roll. Brian. Yes, hello. And um, thank you so much for all of your commitment to the parks and uh, the reappointments. Um, thank you for your recommitment. And also, I really want to acknowledge the uh, members that are uh, terminating their service. Um, Portland is better served because of volunteers like you. Thanks so much. Hi. Hi. Christine. Um, thank you so much, Bonnie, for being here and being willing to step in and, and um, troubleshoot for us this morning. Uh, thank you, Director Long and Commissioner Rubio. Uh, we continue to have very strong interest in our parks and the oversight of our parks. And I'm really grateful for so many talented community members who continue to show up uh, to support um, our, our, uh, our treasures. Um, I'm happy to vote aye. Maps. Um, like my colleagues, I'd like to thank everyone who volunteered to serve in, on this important committee. Um, and thank everyone who served on the committee in the past and is rolling off now. Uh, we appreciate your support and um, I vote aye. Rubio. I want to thank the Parks Nominating uh, Committee for the numerous hours of review, interviews, and deliberations you participated in as part of this new Parks Board member selection process. And I also want to thank the Parks Board for your shared dedication to parks and, and recreation system. You bring such a diversity of perspective, interests, and lived experiences and more. I'm very excited also to continue engaging with Bonnie and John and look forward to getting to know our newest board members who each have such impressive backgrounds. I vote aye. Wheeler. I'm very happy to support this tonight. What a great and impressive group of individuals. Uh, this, this is probably the easiest vote I'm gonna take this week. I vote aye. The appointments are approved. The report is accepted. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Uh, item 427, please. Appoint Brianna weston Scow, David Stazak, and Carl Chang, and reappoint Karen Loper-Tracy to the Portland Parks and Recreation Bond Oversight Committee for terms to expire December 31st, 2023. Colleagues, the Bond Oversight Committee is composed of five very distinguished community members. Each of them was selected by a member of the council. In making our collective selections, we looked for skill sets in finance, construction, community involvement, budgeting, and park services. 
Today, we have the pleasure of announcing the reappointment of one of the members and an appointment of three new community members to our Portland Parks and Recreation 2014 Parks Replacement Bond Oversight Committee. The Bond Oversight Committee members are serving multi-year terms. Commissioner Rubio will speak to the charge of the Oversight Committee. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. As we head into the summer, I wanna thank again, uh, the voters for passing this bond. And it's fair to say that without it, we would be extraordinarily limited in what we could offer our communities this summer. And as we are able to open facilities and offer lessons in camps and welcome people back into our parks, um, we just wanna offer that big appreciation. Um, the bond oversight committee was and continues to be an important part of what was promised to voters with the passing of the 68 million parks replacement bond in November of 2014. Members of the committee are nominated by the city council um, and appointments of new members or extension of appointments of current members are confirmed by the city council. The bond oversight committee monitors how funds are spent and makes sure parks and recreation is delivering on what was promised the bond proposal language. The committee has been reporting annually to council and our community regarding Portland Parks and Recreation performance and the progress towards our goals. The bond oversight committee meets quarterly and its members are free to ask the tough questions of us and the Portland Parks and Recreation staff. Portland Parks and Recreation greatly values having the input, input from the bond oversight committee members. It's invaluable to have a knowledgeable independent group with keen insights that are willing to take the time to dive in a little bit and report directly back to us on how we are doing. Robin Laughlin, bond program manager, will now announce the reappointment of Karen Loper Tracy and the appointment of Brianna Weskin Scow and, and David Stazak and Carl Chang to the bond oversight committee. Robin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioner, Me Commissioner Rubio and members of council. Uh, we are very fortunate to have outstanding community members serving on the bond oversight committee. And as Commissioner Rubio said, we really appreciate the keen insight and active volunteer service uh, to the community that these members provide. The reappointment of Karen Loper Tracy and the appointment of Brianna Westengau, David Stazek, and Carl Cheng to the Bond Oversight Committee is the purpose of our agenda item today. I would like to provide a brief information about each of our candidates of the committee for the terms that will be expiring on December 31st, 2023. Karen Loper Tracy has served on the committee since its inception, and we are asking now that council reappoint her for an additional three-year term so she can participate until the 2014 bond program is complete. Ms. Loper brings a wealth of experience from her career with Portland Parks and Recreation. Starting in college, she held various positions, including volunteer coordinator and outreach and communications manager. She retired from the Bureau in 2012 after four years as assistant director. Her broad exposure to virtually every aspect of the suite of park, park and recreation services makes her an invaluable member of this committee. Karen understands the roles and responsibilities of employees and volunteers and how upgrades to the park system help staff respond to citizen, citizens' recreational needs. She also understands the budgeting protocols and management of funding to meet bureau-wide objectives. She's worked hard on this bond oversight committee in the past and we look forward to her future involvement. Ms. Loper is here with us today. The following three committee members were nominated for their very first time, and we look forward to working with them in the coming years. Brianna Weston Scow was born and raised right here in Portland. Minus a few short years, she lived in Phoenix, Arizona, while pursuing education and training in cosmetology. She returned to Portland to pursue an education and training as a medical assistant at Mount Hood Community College, and currently is a medical assistant at OHSU, and at the lead and is the lead medical assistant at the Benson High School based Health Center. She lives in Southeast Portland with her husband, two dogs, and their three ch chickens. She is excited about applying her interests and in advocacy in partnership with her committee colleagues and city council to help better create a better Portland for all by serving on this committee. David Stasek is an architect and designer at ZGF Architects, originally from Toledo, Ohio. David found his way out west in 1992. In the last 28 years, David has worked to plan, expand, and renovate local and regional hospital campuses. David has worked with the healthcare institutions to design nurturing and healing environments, has fostered a deep appreciation for the healing power of nature. 
He is an avid mountain biker and currently supports the Portland Park and Recreation, Portland Parks and Recreation um, with his service on the Parks Board. He is excited to help make Portland a great place to live, work, and play. Carl Cheng is a senior investment officer at the Oregon State Treasury. Carl grew up in the, North, in the Northeast and moved out to the West Coast in 1999, ultimately settling down in Portland in 2008. He has worked in the investment industry for over 20 years at various organizations and has previous experience in reviewing financial statements and forecast models. Carl has come to appreciate the beautiful parks in Portland, particularly with his two children who have benefited from the athletic fields maintained by Portland Parks and Recreation. He's excited to be considered for the Parks Bond Oversight Committee. We are confident that Karen, Brianna, David, and Carl will bring a wealth of experience and perspective into guiding the work of the bond program. With your approval today, we look forward to working with and receiving guidance from this extraordinary committee. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, colleagues, if there are no questions, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Commissioner Hardesty's motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll, Megan. Brian. Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Rubio, Dr. Long, and Robin for that uh, thorough report. Um, I really am excited about the three people that were just mentioned that are coming on board, Brianna, David, and Carl. Really a uh, lot of skill sets there. And Karen, thank you for your long-term commitment to this work. Uh, you know, voters are really well served when we have someone with your experience at the table monitoring the implementation of, of the voters' wishes. So I'm just really grateful and uh, community members are so well served when we have people like this um, showing up uh, for our city. I vote aye. Hardesty. Aye. Maps. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Brianna, David, Carl, and Karen for stepping up to serve on this um, important committee. We very much appreciate the contributions that you make to our city. I vote aye. Rubio. I also want to thank uh, the, our newest members and uh, for stepping up. And I again, want to thank uh, Portlanders for approving the 2014 uh, Parks Replacement Bond. Because of you, the Bureau has been able to deliver on numerous projects that have had real impacts on the lives of our residents and communities. Um, and thank you to Director Long, uh, Robin, and the bond team for stewing, stewarding the people's money responsibly. Um, an important aspect of the Bureau's work is the oversight provided by this committee. And, and I want to thank everyone who's also served on the committee in the past, including former Parks Director Zari Santner. And I'm also grateful that the new members will continue holding all of us accountable. I vote aye. Wheeler. Well, this is one of the most important assignments that we can uh, ask people to serve on uh, because the most beloved asset that this city manages, of course, are our parks. And that's reflected in the overwhelming support that the public gives to uh, the parks. As, as you know, um, I'm a strong proponent of this bond measure. I think it is critically important that it go to the voters and the voters rewarded the Parks Bureau for their excellent efforts and their vision with an overwhelming passage of this bond. Uh, we all know on the city council that that's where the work really just starts because now it's about accountability and living up to the promises that were made to the voters at the time the bond was passed. And therefore it's really important that we as a city council have people that we know are going to really dig into the details and have a keen understanding of how the dollars are spent and being accountable to the public who ultimately provides those dollars for this purpose. Uh, the uh, folks that you have appointed here are fantastic. I want to applaud Commissioner Rubio for yet again bringing us just an A plus slate of individuals who are willing to roll up their sleeves and support us. I want to thank the Bureau. Um, thank you for uh, the great work that you've already done on deploying uh, or planning the deployment of these bond dollars throughout the city. I think these have been some of the best investments um, that we are making as a council. I'm very happy to vote aye. The report is accepted. The appointments are approved. Thank you all. Next up, 428, time certain. 
appoint James Huang to the Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Board of Trustees for a term to expire December 21st, 2023. Commissioner Hurts. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I will uh, uh, introduce Sam Hutchinson to talk about our distinguished uh, appointee that we would like to add uh, to the uh, police and fire. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> this retirement board thing that we're talking about. Good morning, Sam. Uh, welcome to council. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hardesty, and thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Sam Hutchison, Director of Portland City, City of Portland's Fire, Police, Disability and Retirement Bureau. Um, as you know, the FPDR plan provides disability and retirement benefits to the city's police officers and firefighters. The plan is funded by the FPDR fund, and this fund is overseen by a board of trustees. The board consists of five trustees, the mayor or the mayor's designee, two firefighter and police officer elected trustees, and two citizen trustees. Presently, one of the citizen trustees position is vacant. And for the past few months, FPDR and Commissioner Hardesty's office have conducted a community search for a person interested and qualified to serve as a citizen trustee. Our search has been successful. So today I want to present James Huang to you as a nominee for the vacant position. James Huang has extensive legal experience in the financial sector, which will be immense value to the FPDR Board of Trustees. Presently, he's the second vice president and associate counsel with Standard Insurance Company. I've asked uh, Mr. Huang to uh, provide you with a brief bio and share why he wants to serve as an FPDR trustee. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners Hardesty, Rubio, Maps, and Ryan, as well as Director Hutchinson for the privilege of being considered for the citizen trustee position and for the opportunity to appear before you to introduce myself. As noted in my bio, I am a second vice president and associate counsel at Standard Insurance Company. I'm responsible for leading a team that provides legal advice, to support the standards asset management, retirement, welfare benefits, and other businesses. I specialize in advising financial institutions on their fiduciary services to retirement plans and individuals. Specifically, I have over 20 years of experience in advising retirement plan service providers, their ethical and fiduciary obligations to deliver services in the best interest of investors and, in, and investigating allegations of violations of their standard of conduct. The reason why I would like to be considered for this role is because as a citizen of Portland, I have tremendous respect for our bravest and finest. Our brave firefighters and fine police officers risk their lives each day in order to protect and defend our safety. I would like to make sure that, the, that Portland can attract and retain the most qualified firefighters and police officers by offering sound and competitive pension and disability benefits. This way, our Portland firefighters and police officers will feel financially secure in knowing that they and their loved ones will be protected when they risk their lives to protect us and our loved ones. At the same time, my legal background and experience from working in the financial services industry have given us the necessary, or have given me rather, the necessary discipline to enforce policies and procedures that are designed to comply with laws and regulations that benefit and promote public interest. Therefore, as a member of the board, I am committed to protect the interests of the citizens of Portland by ensuring that the fund is administered in accordance with approved plan provisions and applicable laws at the same time to ensure that the plan delivers the promised benefits that our police officers, firefighters, and their beneficiaries rightfully deserve. I'm excited by the prospect of sharing my knowledge and experience in supporting the mission and purpose of the board and the fund, but most importantly, I am confident that I will be able to represent the citizens of Portland by ensuring that the funds are prudently invested and safeguarded and that plain benefits are fairly administered so as to not disadvantage the public. I thank you for your time and consideration and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor. I'll turn it back over to you. Um, to uh, for next steps. Very good. All right. This is a resolution, colleagues. If there are no additional questions, we'll call the roll. 
Uh, Megan, please call the roll. Ryan. Yes, um, well, thank you very much, James, for stepping up. Um, your credentials are amazing and you're such a perfect fit. And I can tell your heart's into it as well. I vote aye. Hardesty. Thank you so much, Mr. Hung, for uh, your willingness to serve the city of Portland and its really vital role. Um, you are uniquely qualified for this position, uh, both because of the passion in which you spoke, but as well as your professional background. Um, it will be a pleasure to welcome you uh, to the police, fire, uh, the police and fire uh, ret uh, retirement board um, to ensure that both uh, we have a community eye on making sure that we are fiscally responsible, but we also have the community compassion to ensure that we are taking care of our first responders. Um, you are a perfect fit. Thank you, Sam. I, Sam and I have been at this for a while, looking for an ideal new, a new candidate to join this board. And I couldn't have found a better, we couldn't have found a better pick. So thank you so much for your willingness to serve. And I am very happy to vote aye. Maps. Um, James, we are lucky to have you. Thank you for our service to um, our community. I vote aye. Rubio. I want to thank James for stepping up and participating on this board. We are so incredibly grateful. This board has a fair degree of autonomy and ensures our first responders have the support they need for the, their service to our city. And for that reason, it's important to recruit and appoint individuals that can keep this fund healthy and stable. And James, you have the ideal background, as my colleagues have mentioned, and the exposure to ensure that I that that, that happens. And I look forward to your leadership on this board. I vote aye. Wheeler. Well, uh, Mr. Hong, thank you very much for, for stepping forward. This is obviously one of those appointments that requires uh, a great deal of knowledge and understanding of the subject area. Uh, I know you're a very busy man, and so we're really lucky to have the opportunity to benefit from your experience and your knowledge. So thank you for stepping forward. And, and by the way, thank you for a really good statement this morning in front of the council. It just makes it all the easier for me to vote aye. I vote aye. Uh, the resolution is adopted, the appointment's approved. Thank you so much for your service. And thank, thank you, you for the privilege. Uh, great appointment, well done. <laughs> thank you, sir. And that takes us to, let's see, where am I now? Mayor, real quickly, yep. uh -huh. I just wanted to state for the record that no one had signed up uh, to testify for oh, that yeah. item. Thank you for keeping me, uh, keeping me honest. I appreciate that. Next up is the, uh, here, 437, please, on the regular agenda. Proclaim June 3rd, 2021 to be go for broke day. Colleagues, the soldiers of the 100th Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team in Europe, numbering over 14,000 Nisei, or second generation Japanese Americans, along with another 19,000 serving in other units, were instrumental in winning the Second World War. These soldiers helped to liberate Italy, France, and Germany from Nazi tyranny, including the liberation of a subcamp of Dachau concentration camp. Go for broke, a reference to the, high, to the Hawaiian pigeon term that means going all in, was the motto for the 100th Battalion 442nd Regimental Combat Team. The motto was fitting because while most of these soldiers had family members interned back home in the United States, they became the most decorated unit in all of US military history. Overall, they earned more than 18,000 awards in less than two years, including 21 medals of honor, eight presidential citations, more than 4,000 Purple Hearts, and more than 4,000 Bronze Stars. In 2010, surviving members were granted the Congressional Gold Medal by the United States Congress. In 2012, all surviving members were made Chevalier of the French Légion d'Honneur for their contributions to the liberation of France. 
2021 marks 80 years after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the entry of the United States into the Second World War. As time progresses, the number of those who served in this unit or elsewhere during the war continues to dwindle. It's important that at all levels of government, we acknowledge and honor the sacrifices of Nisei soldiers celebrating now and ensuring that their history and their story continues to be shared with future generations. And before I read the proclamation, I will ask for comments. If any, I see Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, colleagues. I'm honored to join you in commemorating National Go for Broke Day. This day was inspired by the 442nd Regimental Co Combat Team of the United States Army. The 442nd RCT was a racially segregated army unit made up of Japanese American soldiers who fought during World War II. That unit went on to become the most decorated infantry regime regiment in the, United, in the history of the United States Army. The 442nd's motto was go for broke. There are lots of lessons to be learned from the 442nd's experience, but there's one that resonates most deeply for me. At the beginning of World War II, Japanese Americans were barred from military service. In fact, during the war, more than 100,000 Japanese Americans were herded into internment camps. That happened here in Portland too. In fact, on May 5th, 1942, Japanese Americans in the Portland metro area were ordered to report to the Pacific International Livestock Exposition a space that at the time was used to exhibit and auction cattle. When the war started, that space was converted into an internment camp for Japanese Americans. More than 3,000 Japanese Americans passed through Portland's internment camp while they waited to be transferred to more permanent internment camps in California, Idaho, and Wyoming. Today, the Portland Expo Center sits on the land where we once imprisoned our Asian American neighbors. Now, one of the only ways to escape in internment camps was to volunteer for the military. And thousands of Japanese Americans did just that. Many of them joined the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. They fought in Europe where they helped drive the fascists out of Italy and they helped liberate France from the Nazis. They fought with astounding bravery. About 18,000 men served in the 442nd. 650 of them died on the battlefield. 67 were declared missing in action. They earned 4,000 Purple Hearts, 4,000 Bronze Stars, 560 Silver Stars, 21 Medals of Honor, and seven Presidential Unit Citations. Now, the 442nd leaves behind many legacies, including things like restoring democracy to Europe. But today we honor another one of their legacies, Go For Broke Day. Of course, as the mayor ma uh, mentioned, Go For Broke was the motto uh, for the 442nd. Go For Broke means to risk everything so that you might accomplish great things. And I'd like to point out that the rituals surrounding National Go For Broke Day are unique. Usually when we come together for proclamations like this, we pause to remember Portland's important historical moments or important civic institutions. But National Go for Broke Day is a little different. Although we must never forget the awesome sacrifices made by the members of the 442nd, the veterans of the 442nd didn't create this day so that we honor them. Instead, they created this day to challenge us to hear a message from our Asian elders. That message is this, go for broke. If our generation is going to accomplish great things, we must be prepared to take great risk and risk great sacrifices. I wanna conclude today by asking you to join me in thinking about this question. What was the great thing the members of the 442nd set out to accomplish? Was it to defeat the Nazis? Well, yes, it was. But I think the 442nd had a deeper mission, one which sadly still resonates today. That mission was to answer this question. 
how do you love a country that does not love you back? Our Asian ancestors answered that question by going for broke, by risking and sometimes sacrificing their lives to make our country better. That's the challenge I hear when I hear the ghost of the 442nd urge us to go for broke. I hope that you will join me and this council in taking up the go for broke challenge by devoting a little bit of your life to public service and civic engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. And thanks for this proclamation today. The Go For Broke soldiers are a part of a recurring story in our country's history. One of a targeted and marginalized community that once again rises up in service to our community and nation, risking their lives so that the residents of the very governments that subject them to mistreatment are able to be safe and their rights protected. Over and over again during World War II, the Nisei community in the US were forced to suffer under racist policies, segregation, political targeting, and still they stepped up to serve their community and country. Service can take on a lot of different forms, but military service means putting your life on the line. And in this case, for people who have, who have made it clear that about their anti-Asian racism and xenophobia, these soldiers demonstrated complete loyalty while their own families and communities were separated and interned against their will and forced to abandon everything they owned, including their homes and livelihood. They not only deserve our sincere gratitude, but they all, but they and all Japanese Americans that were impacted by these policies also deserve our deep apology, our apology for this shameful mistreatment and the promise that we make to stop this cycle of institutional racism in this generation. So to these soldiers and their families, we appreciate and are so grateful for your service and your sacrifice. We admire your character, resiliency, and all of us are in your debt. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Hardison. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you, colleagues. Um, for the second time today, we've acknowledged uh, the really horrible racist history uh, that is, in fact, the United States of America. Um, I have to tell you, a lot of times last year, over the last four years, I've thought about Executive Order 9066, which, as you know, uh, was the um, executive order signed by Roosevelt that um, didn't mention Japanese Americans, but clearly targeted Japanese Americans for, um, uh, for uh, 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 concentration camps uh, in Alaska, Oregon, Washington, and Arizona. Um, just like earlier, and just like our history uh, continues to remind us, um, is that uh, we have a legacy of, uh, of uh, erasure, cultural erasure of people, of communities that continue to step up when America asked um, over and over and over again. And I think sometimes uh, comfortable white America wonders why we do these uh, resolutions, why we acknowledge these past harms, why do we keep bringing up these things that they had nothing to do with? Um, uh, there's a saying uh, that goes, uh, those who don't remember their past are doomed to repeat it. And I think we need a constant reminder of the cruelty that has been experienced by many people of color in the United States of America, but also the continuous resilience, passion, and desire to give back uh, in ways uh, that many times don't benefit those communities directly. These soldiers put their lives on the line and they put their lives on the line to protect people that would not even protect them. It's a legacy that the United States continues to struggle with we try to pretend that now we're all like uh, what a melting pot, but the reality is, is that until we really confront our racist history, there's no way to create a more just, more fair, and more transparent future. This is who we were, and in many cases, who we continue to be. 
thank you for this today. Thank you, Commissioner Hurst and Commissioner Ryan. Yes, um, thank you, Mayor Wheeler, for bringing this proclamation forth and for the compelling words by all of my colleagues that have gone prior. It is so important to have this opportunity to reflect on the courage. Boy, it was courageous for that, the Japanese American veterans, but also for the hurt and the trauma of being othered by this country. As we've learned, um, many of us today, hopefully the go for broke means that Japanese American soldier, soldiers were putting it all on the line both to fight the evil overseas and to demonstrate their patriotism, as many of their families and friends remain in these camps locked up and for their alleged disloyalty to our country. The trauma alone of being on the front lines of war is something very few of us experience. The added layer of defending a country that discriminates your identity and culture is quite unimaginable. Now, thank you, Commissioner Maps, for earlier saying, how do you love a country that does not love you? Today, I honor the Japanese American veterans who fought in World War II and for the Japanese families who endured the pain of war and the trauma of being other. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, colleagues. On behalf of the Portland City Council, whereas over 33,000 Nisai, second generation Japanese Americans, served with honor in the United States military during World War II. And whereas, as described in the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, race, prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership led to over 120,000 Japanese Americans being forced from their homes in West Coast states and incarcerated in 10 internment camps and relocation centers including the Pacific International Livestock Exposition Center, now known as the Portland Expo Center. And whereas these Americans served in the famed 100th Battalion 442nd Regimental Combat Team in Europe, which became to this day, the most decorated unit in United States military history for their size and length of service. And whereas, Nisei also served in the United States Army's Military Intelligence Service, MIS, as military linguists in the war with Japan in the Pacific Theater. And whereas Japanese American World War II Nisei soldiers, including those from Portland, were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal in 2011 for their exemplary service and patriotism. And whereas the United States Postal Service is issuing a commemorative Go for Broke Soldiers stamp that would tell the inspiring story of the patriotic service of Japanese Americans during World War II. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, mayor of the city of Portland, Oregon, the city of roses, do hereby proclaim June 3rd, 2021 to be Go for Broke Day in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this day. Thank you colleagues. Next up is item 438, please. Accept bid of Interlochen Inc. for the Outer Halsey Safety, Northeast 114th Avenue to Northeast 162nd Avenue project for $2,555,260. Colleagues, this is a procurement report to execute a construction contract at pedestrian facilities to Northeast Halsey, which is a high crash network street. The facilities include sidewalk infill, enhanced lighting, and ADA accessible curb ramp upgrades. Interim Chief Procurement Officer Kathleen Brennis Marua is here to present the report. Good morning, Kathleen. How are you today? Good morning, Mayor. I'm fine. Thank you. Excellent. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, I am Kathleen brennis Marua, Interim Chief Procurement Officer, and I am here to recommend authorization to enter into a contract with Interlaken Incorporated for the Outer Halsey Northeast 114th Avenue to Northeast 162nd Avenue project. On March 3rd, Council authorized procurement services to issue a solicitation for this project with an engineer's estimate of 2.6 million and the confidence level was moderate. 
Bids were received on May 4th and we received seven bids. Interlaken submitted the lowest responsive bid in the amount of $2,555,260, which is approximately 2% below the engineer's estimate. The city's aspirational 20% subcontractor and supplier utilization goal applied. Interlaken has committed to subcontract 47.7% to firms certified by the state's Certification Office for Business Inclusion and Diversity as identified in the report before you. They are self-performing 50.42% of the work and subcontracting the remaining 1.88% to non-certified firms. In reviewing Interlochen's good faith efforts, we confirmed that they conducted significant outreach and found that they subcontracted to certified firms in the areas of work where certified firms submitted bids. And in those areas of work subcontracted to non-certified firms, they did not receive any bids despite their efforts. Interlaken is in full compliance with all city contracting requirements and I here recommend that council accept this report and authorize execution of the contract. Uh, I'll take any questions regarding the procurement process. Uh, Lisa Patterson, Capital Project Manager with the Bureau of Transportation is also in attendance if there are questions about the project itself, as well as Kerry Waters, PBOT's Contract Equity Coordinator. Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do have a couple of questions about Interlaken Inc. Uh, do you know the history of their contracting with the city of Portland? I do. They have had 23 prior contracts with the city uh, for a total of about uh, $20 million. Um, and they have generally met or exceeded the 20% aspirational goal. Um, they depend on how. Um, so what I see is 20, uh, a $2.8 million, I'm sorry, a $3.7 million contract with $12,500 going to people of color contractors. With a contract that we have a 20 year relationship with. Um, and, for, and I heard you use words very carefully, like uh, who submitted bids. But what I didn't hear was the due diligence around what was the work done uh, long before this contract was put out for bid to ensure that there would be more equitable outcomes uh, as far as uh, the diversity of the subcontracting opportunities. So I'm uh, happy to jump in here. Oh, go ahead, Kathleen. No, I was going to say that inter, uh, representative from Interlaken was not able to join us today, uh, and therefore uh, I am not able to speak on the history of their good faith efforts to minority firms. But I, I didn't ask you to speak on their effort. I asked you to speak on the city's effort in ensuring that someone who's had 20 years of contracts with the city could do better than $12,000 in subcontracts to minority-owned firms. So I'm not asking the company, I'm asking you as a city representative. All right, thank you for clarifying. Uh, through our current uh, policies and contract specifications um, and with our solicitation process, um, we encourage contractors to um, outreach to minority firms um, and ultimately uh, we do the best that we can in working with the contractors in reviewing their uh, submissions and asking the questions um, of, is there anything better that they can do? Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we are unable to require that they subcontract uh, with minority firms. Um, Mayor, I'm not satisfied with this answer that I'm getting from procurement. I mean, this is not a new conversation. We've had it just about every week for three years since I've been here. Um, I did a little of my own investigation and found out that uh, like New Way Concrete has been um, on the emerging small business list for 20 years. Um, what, what do we do to actually make sure that 
we are doing our due diligence before we continue uh, these relationships that don't meet the needs of the city of Portland or what we say our values are. We've had two resolutions this morning that really talk about our racist history and how it's kind of just embedded in the system. And I can't think of a better representation than how we do procurement at the city of Portland. So this is my bureau, PBOT. And I hold my bureau just as responsible as I hold other people's bureaus for appropriately representing what we say we want to do. This contract in no way represents that. And so, um, and it is unacceptable to get the same tired answer over and over and over again about why we cannot do better to ensure opportunity for uh, BIPOC uh, small business owners. So I am really disappointed. I continue to be disappointed. I continue to hear about what we're gonna do, but then I get proposals like this that just send my blood boiling. So I'm done. I would be happy to jump in um, if that's all right. Um, for the record, Carrie. Carrie Waters and I serve as PBOT's contract equity coordinator. Um, so we've had a gap uh, over the past few months within our forecasting, which previously looked out over the next quarter's worth of projects, which we know was not enough. So recently we unveiled our new forecasting model, which looks out currently to the end of this calendar year. And we hope that we can increase that uh, time frame for future forecasts that we can share out. So I am hopeful that we will be able to get the information out about our projects within our BIPOC um, business community, um, as well as our contracting community as a whole, and to use that as an opportunity to remind the primes that we have higher expectations that we want to hold them to. So I would be happy to reach out to Interlochen directly and to have a conversation about what it would look like for them to increase the diversity of their sub subcontractors working with them. Um, same holds with any of our other primes that we work with, um, and I, I hope that we can do better. Uh, thank you, Carrie. I, I appreciate the work that you are attempting to do as our, um, our uh, uh, as the person is really looking at how we contract. And my comments are uh, were not directed at you, but kind of at a system that continues to accept the very bare minimal and then congratulate ourselves for uh, uh, exceeding our aspirational goals. Uh, th these are not my aspirational goals. It's that 12,000 out of a $3 million contract going to communities of color. That is not acceptable in any way, shape or form. And the fact that we can say this, uh, the prime has done business with the city of Portland for 20 years, it says to me that we have done nothing to hold the prime accountable for what we say our values are. Could, could I suggest a resolution? This puts some of us in an awkward position. Um, as the commissioner in charge of PBOT, this contract is being brought by PBOT. And if the commissioner in charge is not going to support it, um, it puts the rest of us in kind of a difficult spot. Do you want to pull this back to your office, commissioner? Yes, Mayor, I think I do, because I, I that's, this isn't acceptable to me. It shouldn't be acceptable to any of us that we continue to do this as if, you know, it's like, yeah, we'll fix it tomorrow, right? After three years, I've had this conversation and nothing's changed. All right, so, yeah. and, and I, I would I would welcome your, your taking a harder look at this in PBOT to see if there's, there's something else you could bring back to council. Thank I, you, I, I don't want to speak for the rest of my colleagues, but... You, can I just get a thumbs up if you agree that that's the right resolution here? It looks like I see yes. Okay, good. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, next item is uh, 439, please. Authorize the acquisition of 0.5 acres of real property at 1949 Southeast 122nd, adjacent to Mill Park for $950,000 to be used for park purposes. Uh, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Mill Park is an undeveloped park in a very diverse um, park-sufficient neighborhood in East Portland. 
and neighbors have been advocating and waiting for decades for this to become a reality. And so I'm thrilled to recently have approved SDC funding to fully develop the park. The park has a little street frontage and this acquisition will allow parks to address issues of access and visibility. Zelaine Nunn and Robin Johnson Craig are here from parks to make a brief presentation and answer any questions. Hello, I, think, <laughs> I, I believe the council clerk is going to uh, provide the presentation. Thank you. There it is. Hi, uh, Mayor Wheeler and members of the council. My name is Robin Johnson Craig. I'm a capital project manager within the asset and development division of Portland Parks and Recreation. And with me here today is Elaine Nunn Peterson from our property and business development group. We are here today to request council to authorize the acquisition of 0.5 acres of real property at 1949 Southeast 122nd adjacent to Mill Park for $950,000 to be used for park purposes. Uh, next slide, please. The Mill Park development site is located in the Mill Park neighborhood east of I-205 between Southeast Stark and Southeast Division and closely adjacent to Southeast 122nd Avenue. The site is a point, the park site is a 5.66 acre undeveloped neighborhood park located in the park deficient area of East Portland. Next slide, please. A closer look at the acquisition property location illustrates that Mill Park is located within the block bounded by Southeast 117th, Southeast Mill Court, Southeast 122nd and Southeast Lincoln in of course this park deficient area of Portland. Uh, the park is located next to Mill Park Elementary School and the David Douglas School District. The acquisition site is located directly onto 122nd, identified in red in the picture um, in the slide presented, and will provide a direct physical linkage for the park access to Southeast 122nd. Additionally, the acquisition property is located directly north of the designated safe routes to school route crossing of Southeast 122nd, which complements the recent street crossing improvements by PBOT located at Southeast Stevens and Southeast 122nd. Southeast 122nd has been identified by PBOT as part of the Vision Zero High Crash Network as a high crash corridor. The main Mill Park land that you see, the 5.66 acre property um, of Portland Parks, was transferred to the city of Portland ownership in a transfer agreement from Multnomah County in 1986. The Mill Park site has sat undeveloped for the past 35 years. In fact, Mill Park was identified in the mid Multnomah County Master Plan for Neighborhood Parks in 1984, that the location of the site behind the single multifamily residences with only these panhandle entrances from the dead end Southeast Mill Court to the north and from Southeast Lincoln Street to the south prohibited ade adequate physical and visual access from neighborhood streets. Further, the 1986 Multnomah County Master Plan recommended that unless, unless access could be rectified, it was recommended to trade the Mill Park site. Uh, next slide, please. The Mill and Mid Midland Parks combined master plan by Portland Parks for the Mill Park site was adopted by council in 2017 and includes various amenities for the developed park vetted and supported by a comprehensive public outreach process. The limited visibility and physical access into and out of the park were one of the main constraints identified by the public and design team and the master plan for the overall safety and security of the future park. This acquisition will help us to address those concerns. The next slide, please. Overall funding for the project for the park development was allocated in two phases. 6.5 million in 2020 and an additional 5.5 million in 2021 for a total project funding of 12 million, which will cover property acquisition, land use, permitting, design, and construction. The purchase price of the property is 950,000, which will be paid for with park system development charge funds, which have already been approved for the purpose. 1.6 million for the property has been allocated. In addition to the purchase price, all acquisition and stabilization costs will be paid for with parks STCs. The improvements are intended to create an inviting new community space for the public and will be a major step towards providing equity and park access and development for all Portlanders. Uh, next slide, please. When I presented the CMGC 
alternative contracting ordinance for Mill Park to council in April this year, I shared that when Philly developed, Mill Park would serve 1,440 households. Of those 1,440 Mill Park households, there were going to be 881 new and unique households not served by, other, by Portland Park's one half mile level of service area. Since April, we have received new updated GIS data. And with the new property acquisition as part of the park development, the developed Mill Park site will serve 1,789 households. And of those, there will be 1,039 new and unique households served by this park. With the park, with the property acquired, this will yield an increase of a total 215 dwelling units and served and 151 new and unique dwelling units to be served by the developed park. Uh, next slide. Um, we request council's approval of this ordinance, which will allow PPNR to purchase the additional property to support the development of Mill Park and to provide a direct and physical linkage uh, through 122nd to the park for residents of the Mill Park neighborhood. Uh, next slide. Thank you and I'd be happy, Elaine and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions at this particular point? Any public testimony? Yes, we have one individual on the call. Edith Gillis. Right, the record. Great, thank you. Edith Gillis, are you able to unmute yourself? Can you, can you hear yep, me? We can hear you, Edith. Yep, good morning. My degree. My degrees from the University of Oregon include recreation and park management, field biology, and elementary education. This proposal is consistent with best practices in each degree and area, and with my PSU degree in child development. It's a needed step towards fairness. Nature areas and parks, community building, increase health, reduce stress, and reduce gun violence. Even in my park-enriched neighborhood, where I currently live, we need and cherish our teeny Ivon Park from three small houses that were condemned for a highway. We'll have more pandemics and we'll need more outdoor spaces for social distancing and more parks between our different earthquakes when buildings crash. Vote yes. Thank you. Colleagues, any further questions? Otherwise, I will call the roll. Go ahead, Megan, read the roll. Brian. Yes, um, thank you, Commissioner Rubio. And thank you, uh, Ms. Peterson, for bringing this forward. I'm really happy to support this next step in getting this project moving along. It will have a great, um, um, let's see, I'm actually reading the wrong one. <laughs> but, I, but it actually sounded really similar to how I would have started this one. Um, I'm just really happy to see uh, this is an area that's been a desert, if you will, in terms of parks. And I'm really familiar with the school there. And so it, that, he does some testimony was spot on. And I think um, providing access um, to that uh, part, which is um, facing, I believe it's west of the park is so necessary. So it's really, it's really good government action. And um, anyway, so thank you. I do have some questions and I'll, I'll talk to Commissioner Rubio offline just about um, the, you know, how we'll, move, we'll move, work with the people um, that are in those homes, if you will. But um, this just looks like a great practice and I'm really delighted to vote yes. Hi. Artisty. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Uh, thank you, Parks Bureau. And as we know, um, East Portland has a deficit of trees and parks and open spaces for children to be able to enjoy the outdoors. Um, any additional park purchases is a positive for the community um, as we continue to address the, the changes in our climate. I am very, very happy to support um, this, uh, uh, this, this effort um, and I'm very grateful that we are continuing to prioritize areas of the city uh, that lack green spaces and open spaces and tree canopy. Uh, it is vital for the health of our community in East Portland that we continue to expand park access. I vote aye. 
Maps. Aye. Rubio. Thank you, Zelaine and Robin, for your presentation today. And thank you again to Edith for your comments and support today as well. Um, a couple months ago, I had the opportunity to join community members um, that included uh, Mill Park school leaders, the schools adjacent to the park, um, nonprofit partners and staff at Mill Park to celebrate what will be a very uh, incredible place to build community and to play and to enjoy respite in a part of our city that's greatly lacking green space. And acquiring this property brings us one step closer uh, down the road of making this neighborhood dream a reality for kids and families who've been waiting for decades. So very happy that this project is moving forward and I vote aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thanks everybody. Thank you. 440 four, four, please. Authorize one year extensions for seven grant agreements with youth servicing organizations in support of the Teen Collaborative Initiative for an additional per grant increase of $15,000 and a total increase of $105,000 for the seven grants. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Um, today, I would like to welcome and introduce staff from Portland Parks and Recreation's Teen Force Team. Today uh, with us uh, are Darrell Singleton and Andre Channel. Their presentation today will provide insight into the ongoing um, efforts to engage youth in our city in collaboration with community partners. I'm familiar with this work and the positive impact it has had on the lives of young people in, in my formal role as a nonprofit director at Latino Network. The primary focus is to highlight the impact of Portland Parks and Recreation's team collaborative in initiative grant program and new strategies on how to leverage existing relationships to improve equity within program participation, seasonal and per permanent employment, and making for a welcoming environment for all communities within Portland's park and recreation system. So now I would like to introduce Darrell um, Singleton, P Portland Parks and Recreation, uh, Recreation Strategies and Initiatives Manager. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Good morning, Mayor and City Council. Uh, today, I wanna to provide an overview of our Portland Parks and Recreation Team Grant Program. Um, with me today, like Commissioner Rubio mentioned, is Andre Channel. He is our Team Force Coordinator at Charles Jordan, Middle, uh, Charles Jordan Community Center. Um, and he's gonna give a little bit of testimony at the end of my presentation. So I will get started. Um, I have a PowerPoint. I thought it might have been shared. If not, I can go ahead and try to share screen myself. If you'd like, we can bring it up for you. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Perfect. Just one moment. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, Portland Parks Recreation Teen Grant Program was launched in 2016. The grant program provided a new opportunity to support community-based organizations to extend Portland Park and Recreation's reach to teen programming and provide teen enrichment activities, including fitness, mentorship, educational support outside of school. The, team, the program provided access, of five to, access to five PPNR community centers. The grant program has been successfully renewed every two years, and in 2019, we had a competitive process to select youth-serving organizations as grantees. Each organization was provided a two-year $80,000 grant. Next slide. The seven youth-serving organizations selected in 2019 and part of this grant amendment council action today are Elevate Oregon, ERCO, Latino Network, NEA, New Avenues of Youth, POIC, and Self-Enhancement Inc., as you can see on your screen. The proposed grant extension will allow agencies to continue youth efforts, some of which have been slow due to, the, to COVID public health restrictions. Next slide. As the city and Portland Parks and Recreation continue to be a more equitable employer, program providers, and community, and community resource, we have the opportunity to engage our partners in a new and more collaborative manner. In this proposed grant amendment, we will partner with our community partners in how we program, how we recruit, interview, and hire employees. Current efforts to garner community partner feedback have been designed and implemented in our current summer seasonal and permanent recruitments. 
To support this partnership assistance in this process, Portland Parks is proposing partners receive an additional $15,000 to help identify youth and adults in PPNR recruitments. Taking a pause because I think I might have went through these a little fast, so I want to make sure people can see the slides. Next slide. Community partners will provide employment coaching, employment coaches to ensure success for youth and young adults transitioning into the workforce. As you see in the presentation, a variety of support programs will be provided and bolstered through this enhanced partnership. We hope additional resources provided will provide a greater opportunity to organizations to connect to youth um, in employment, provide more of an insight to the impact of the expanding partnership. I would like to introduce Andre Channel. Andre is unique to many of our team coordinators. He is our current team force coordinator at Charles Jordan. But prior to PPNR, Andre worked as the Dean of Students for POYC, one of our existing partners. So with that, I would like to concede the floor to Andre. Uh, could we remove the screen, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Darrell. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I'm clear. All right, perfect. Uh, Mayor, commissioners, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for the floor. I really do appreciate this. Um, good morning. My name is Andre Channel. I'm a Team Force Coordinator at Charles Jordan Community Center. I've supported and advocated for community youth for over 20 years. I'm a native Oregonian, born and raised in North Portland. North hate to be exact by Unthink Park. Uh, I grew up in a time where it felt like everyone in the community knew each other. There was a connection. Unfortunately, we've been disconnected. This disconnection has had a negative impact on one of our most vulnerable populations, youth. This has been a tough year filled with trauma and loss. And we're only in June. The Teen Collaborative Initiative is a step in the healing and growth process. It provides safe and supportive spaces for our youth. Mission aligned partnerships connecting community teens to community resources. One of the things I learned in my time serving the community is that we cross paths and advocate for the same youth. A teen at POIC may also be enrolled in a program or activity at Urco or Matt Dishman. The Teen Collaborative Initiative intentionally brings those organizations, organizations together in partnership with the city to provide culturally specific wraparound services, leveraging our strengths and applying them strategically to the issues youth face. Like Charles Jordan said, we are more than fun and games. It's about pro-social activities that promote self-esteem, leadership and skill development, academic support, and community involvement. And sometimes we just listen and let a youth share their story. I look forward to revitalizing and expanding our ongoing collaborations. There's work to do. But together, in partnerships, values, and missions, we can collectively make positive and lasting impacts. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Andre. And like I said, there was a quick overview. And so that is the end of our presentation, but we want to at least hold time for if there are any questions and I'll be happy to try to answer whatever I can. Very good, Commissioner Hardest. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Darrell. And thank you, Andre. I really appreciate uh, the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio for bringing us forward. It sounds like the additional 15,000 is to help with recruitment this summer. Is that an accurate statement? That is, that is an accurate statement. That is the primary focus, but it's also to expand our reach. But hiring is the primary number one. And so the, the, the goal is to have uh, these youth serving organizations prepare young people for employment with the Park Bureau this summer. It's to prepare, but also be a, a, I would refer to it as a gateway. Historically, um, many of our communities have struggled with different parts of our hiring system or getting into our program. So we are being very intentional and deliberate in working with partners to get them through the system, identifying roadblocks and detours, and trying to eliminate those in the process. 
we've already started to see fruits of that in our hiring process with a, a extreme increase of folks coming from these different organizations in these communities. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I was just trying to, I, I, I got a lot of information or just yep. trying to really narrow down and say these, this additional dollars is really to support Absolutely. Um, their successful employment opportunities. Got it. Thank you. That's, that was very helpful. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Commissioner Ryan. <clears throat> Commissioner Ryan. You're on mute. Yeah, muted. Yeah, there we go. I swear I clicked it. Um, anyway, thank you, Darrell, and thank you, Andre. I think when I hear a presentation like this, it's, it's, it's important to take a pause just on how challenging it's been this past year. Right. And you think about all of these programs and services that just didn't happen last year. So, but for anyone that's watching, can you just give an example of, you know, a, a program uh, that, that didn't happen because of COVID that really hits you the hardest? Um, it hits the hardest. I guess the, the way I would say it is one of the big pieces about the team grant is allowing access to Portland parks and recreation facilities giving alternative options for folks. Um, and right now you could define it in multiple ways. And I think I was sitting on when I heard the, the, young, the young youth talking about accessing uh, programs and accessing facilities, that lack of accessing facilities has given or hasn't given youth the opportunity to do things that are not positive. You know, one of the things we talk about is pro-social activities with positive adults in front of them. Um, that lack of that contact and that relationship allows them to do things that we all do not want to do. Um, you know, we talk about um, the ongoing um, impacts and violence that are going on in our city, and that makes so sure that shapes in all different forms. Um, I would say, I know for a fact, we have lost 12 kids that were part of our Team Forest program just in Portland Parks. I could speak. You know, if I had the partners here, I'm sure they could speak to that same uh, impact and the amount of folks they've lost because of violence. And I don't want to just say to gun violence, to just depression and several other things. So this is going to be crucial to get these programs back up and just having space for them to engage with adults. Well, Terrell, you know, I, I didn't give you a warning. I was going to ask the question, but you sure got to the heart of the matter. And I hope everyone could just see how all these dots connect. And I think having this extra investment to get this up and running again is so crucial at this time. Uh, sometimes it feels like the year that we lost was so much damage. And so I'm really grateful that Commissioner Rubio uh, brought this forward today. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public testimony, Megan? Yes, one individual has signed up. All right. All right, Edith Gillis, can you hear us? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yep, you sound great. This and more is needed. I speak as a professional and volunteer serving underserved youth and their families for over half a century. It's a start towards serving, hiring, mentoring, and training youth in the recreation profession. It does not address trans and queer kids and their young adults. This does not reach any of my former 16 foster kids or foster children who are dumped at age 16 without employment outside the sex industry or housing. It does not serve um, many of the Asian and Pacific Islander youth. Um, I love volunteering for ERCO and NEA. They're wonderful. See, SEI um, helped my youngest child with uh, Minds Matter graduate from Wellesley College with, with honors so that she could then pay it forward, um, bringing in a lot of funding and, and good justice for the Social Justice Fund Northwest, for the Women's Alliance in California, the YWCA, et cetera. We know that by giving children respect, giving youth real options and teaching good career uh, skills, we can make a difference stopping the spiral downward of despair and self-destruction and violence towards hope and um, the regeneration, the truth and conciliation that our society needs. Um, 
please vote yes on this and don't stop with that. We need much more, much, much more. We need to hire, train, and better serve youth and young adults currently excluded and harmed. I look forward to seeing more progress. Thank you, Edith, appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Rubio. Hi, I just wanna say one more thing. And thank you, Edith, for the, those comments. Um, but I just wanted to really appreciate the exceptional work of Darrell and Andre in this program. This, I, I just need to lift up and thank you, uh, Commissioner Ryan, for starting, starting um, uh, these comments to uh, lift up that this is just a very important example of a partnership between government and community-based organizations. And uh, these individuals understand uh, the importance of trust and credibility in our programs and having a, a positive and lasting impact on these young people in their lives. So I just wanna uh, lift that up because this is an important um, uh, example of how, what we need to be doing more of at the city. So thank you, Jarrell, and thank you, Andre, for this great work. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I also wanna thank Andre and Jarrell and Anita, thank you for your testimony. Uh, as always, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Next item, 441, please. Authorize architect engineer design services contract for Mount Scott Community Center seismic retrofit and expansion project for amount not to exceed $3,566,328 and add the Mount Scott Community Center expansion project to the Parks and Recreation System Development Charge Capital Improvement Plan. This is also a non-emergency ordinance, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Portland Parks and Recreation is striving to provide more recreational activity or opportunities to the residents of Southeast uh, Portland, an area that falls behind the level of service guidelines for parks and community centers. Improvements to an expansion of <clears throat> Scott, Scott, Scott Community Center under this project will allow Portland Parks and Recreation to narrow the gap in services provided to Portland's growing community. Using a combination of funds from the Build Portland Initiative and system development charges will allow Portland Parks and Recreation to address numerous deficiencies at Mount Scott Community Center and expand services to the community. Build Portland funds will address critically needed improvements at Mount Scott Community Center and thus address the City of Portland's inventory of unreinforced masonry structures. Leveraging the seismic retrofit and roof replacements project with SDC funds allows for expansion and improvements of a widely used community center that would otherwise not be possible. The combined seismic and expansion project will remove significant maintenance barriers allowing for development of an asset management plan and moving Portland Parks and Recreation to a more sustainable future. So now I will turn it over to staff for their presentation. Hi, this is Marlo Medellin. I wonder, I can't seem to get my video started. Uh, can council clerk start my video? Um, oh, it looks like whatever you just hit a second ago allowed, allowed you to share for a moment. Unfortunately, we don't have that capability to start your video on your behalf. But we can pull up the presentation. Is that what you'd like okay. us to do? Yes. <clears throat> I'm okay, sorry, perfect. I have to apologize. The video is not loading somehow. Oh, here we go. No, it does not. My apologies. Um, <clears throat> Hello, Mayor Wheeler and members of council. Uh, my name is Marlo Millian. I am Capital Project Manager with Portland Parks and Recreation. I'm here today to request council authorization for a competitive RFP award in contracting with the most responsive and responsible proposer for design of the Mount Scott Community Center seismic and expansion project. In my presentation today, I will share an overview of the project of the project funding sources and how the project fits within the larger goals for PPNR sustaining the future. Next slide. Mount Scott Community Center is located in Southeast Portland. 
in the Mount Scott Arvita neighborhood at the intersection of Southeast 72nd Avenue and Southeast Herald Street, just south of Foster Boulevard. This area is currently undergoing a significant level of urban development and increasing recreational capacity will provide services to an underserved community. This project will re revitalize an aged community center in an expanding Portland. Next slide. The project is part of the 2018 OMF Build Portland funds that were generously awarded by OMF to address critical park needs that are otherwise unfunded. The Build Portland initiative was proposed by Mayor Wheeler to address the financial challenges of maintaining city infrastructure and begin to close the infrastructure gap. The Mount Scott Community Center project was awarded $15 million to address urgent needs for seismic retrofit, roof and pool mechanical system repairs. The program fits into the city's plan to address URM, unreinforced masonry, seismic deficiencies, deferred maintenance to reduce the major maintenance backlog, a sustainable future for PPNR assets and facility operations, and high performance buildings. In addition to $15 million in Bill Portland funding, Portland Parks is seeking to invest $8.5 million from system development charges to expand the community center and address the growing need for programming space. The total project allocation is $23.5 million. Next slide. While the Bill Portland project will address much needed seismic and structural deficiencies, that, that would otherwise not be addressed, most of the structure would remain in its current condition even after the seismic improvements. Conditions such as failing outdated mechanical systems, accessibility barriers, deteriorated infrastructure, and hazardous materials would remain in the current condition. Next slide. However, the Build Portland project provides a unique opportunity for significant building improvements. By leveraging Build Portland funds, we can begin to address long-standing deficiencies to city infrastructure that would otherwise not be possible under park funding alone. By addressing long-standing seismic, roof, HVAC, electrical, safety, security, and health and environmental deficiencies, parks can begin to move toward more energy efficient, sustainable operations. Additionally, by investing system development charge funds, Portland Parks can address the need for increased square footage in order to expand recreational programming and service at Mount Scott Community Center, as well as improving accessibility, again, moving us toward a more sustainable future. Next slide. By leveraging funds, we can attain maximum return on investment. This graphic shows the conceptual renovation and expansion that we can obtain by leveraging funds. Next slide. The project details include demolishing existing URM elements, rebuilding the structure to meet current seismic code, enlarging the building footprint to expand recreation programs by nearly 11,000 square feet. We'll improve accessibility, mitigate hazardous materials, and try to reach our sustainable operations. Next slide. The construction estimate for the project is $14 million. The proposal uh, for design, the A&E design fee is $3.57 million. The design consultant team is led by FFA architects. Through their work, 20.3% of the 3.57 million and contract fees were awarded to state certified disadvantaged, minority owned, women owned and emerging small businesses. The COVID participation is broken by minor, uh, minority business enterprise at 12.2%, women business enterprise at 11.5% and emerging small business at 1.6%. Next slide. So why are we here? We are here to request two items from council. We request that council authorize revision of SDC CIP list to include Mount Scott expansion project. 
We also request that council authorize competitive contract with the lowest responsive and responsible bidder for design of the Mount Scott Seismic and Expansion Project. With the acceptance of this authority to award by council, we will proceed with contract award and commence immediately this spring. We anticipate construction start 2023, summer 2023, and a completion date by fall 2025. Next slide. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. Colleagues, any questions at this particular? He signed up to testify. Signed up to testify. No one is on the call for this item. All right, very good. I don't see questions. Uh, so thank you. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. We'll go back to the consent agenda. There were two items pulled. The first item was 432, please. Accept the report of the Chief Procurement Officer on the photographic traffic enforcement system for an initial term of five years and a contract value of $15 million. Colleagues, this is a procurement report to expand our photographic traffic enforcement system in Portland's intersections and high crash corridors. As part of Portland's Vision Zero Action Plan, the Bureau of Transportation and the Police Bureau have been collaborating to make our streets safer for both pedestrians and vehicles. Our current systems of mobile and fixed cameras has helped to mitigate both speeding and red light running, leading to an average 38% reduction in traffic injuries. Expanding the system will aid further in the reduction of traffic violence. Procurement Manager Scott Schneider is here to present the report, I believe. Scott, are you the one presenting? I am. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, and good morning, Commissioners. I'm Scott Schneider, Procurement Manager for Goods and Services. I'm here this morning to recommend the Council accept the Chief Procurement Officer's report and award a contract to Conduent State and Local, Inc. for the Photographic Traffic Enforcement System. This contract will support the Portland Bureau of Transportation and Portland Police Bureau's Vision Zero program by updating and expanding the existing photo enforcement system equipment and implementation. On December 13th, 2019, the city issued request for proposals 1342. And on February 7th, three proposals were received. An evaluation committee scored the proposals in accordance with chapter 5.33 of city code and deemed Conduit State and Local Inc. to be the most responsive and qualified proposer. Conduit is not certified by the Certification Office for Business Inclusion and Diversity. Conduit has proposed to subcontract 5.7% of the contract value to COVID certified firms. Conduit is in full compliance with the city's contracting requirements. If you have any questions about the solicitation process, I can answer those. Also, if you have any questions about the photographic traffic enforcement program or about Vision Zero, we have representatives from both PBOT and from the Portland Police Bureau here to address those as well. Very good. Why don't we do this? Megan, who pulled this? Edith Gillis. All right. Why don't we let Edith testify? And if that generates any questions, we can have them answered. Edith, go, go ahead if you're here. Is she still on, Megan? She is. Edith, are you unable to, are you able to mute yourself, unmute yourself? Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. While Edith is working on that, I do have a couple of questions. Um, I know it took us a while to actually finally get this uh, new contract underway. Um, and I'm curious, it's a five-year contract. And so what, what do we get for this five years, $15 million expenditure? 
Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. So um, this contract will expand the current photographic enforcement program um, by adding cameras, expanding it to additional intersections and upgrading the existing equipment. Um, How many additional uh, cameras are we going to have? Uh, let me let me um, turn that question over to one of the project staff uh, to answer. Thanks, Commissioner Hardesty. This is Dana Dickman with the Portland Bureau of Transportation. I'm our safety section manager. We are planning on essentially doubling the system that we have now. You'll remember that we have eight fixed speed cameras and 10 intersection cameras. This contract will allow us to go up to 20 fixed speed cameras and 20 intersection cameras. So it's essentially doubling, a little bit more than doubling the system we have now. I wanna clarify that it's an up to $15 million contract. The way that the pricing works um, is that we, we pay for citations processed that are paid. So we pay our contractor based on the volume of citations paid rather than a situation where they're just getting paid whether the camera's going or not. Um, so it's an up to 15 million. It's not that we know exactly what we're gonna spend because it's based on how the cameras are functioning. It, thank you, I, I, that's, that's very helpful, thank you. So it is up to 15 uh, million and it is a five-year contract. Um, what, is, how is the, what is the process to determine what is the most need uh, for speed cameras? What, how, is, how will PBOT prioritize? Because I suspect every community will say we need one, except by, uh, I would expect. How, how will we prioritize that? We have um, kind of a, a multifaceted approach with the first piece really looking at where we're seeing injuries from either speed or um, red light disregard. So when we're looking at intersection cameras, we're looking at a crash history of red light running at an intersection and whether or not that's contributing to injury crashes. And then for speed cameras, we're doing a similar thing where we're looking at segmentation of our high crash network. I should be clear, we can only use the fixed speed cameras on our high crash network by state. That's what's in state law. So we look at where we've had speed related fatality and injury crashes and identify those areas as priority first. There's also some technical analysis that leads into it. Like for certain intersections are technically we can't um, enforce there either visibility issues or angles like cameras just won't work at certain intersections. Um, and same with uh, the speed cameras. If we don't have a way to functionally enforce in that area, we can't do that. We're also trying to be really conscious of not overburdening any one neighborhood with too many cameras. So looking at geogra geographic distribution of the cameras throughout the city. So those are kind of the three prongs of the methodology. Uh, thank you, that is really helpful. And I know that this requires us to be in partnership with uh, the police bureau um, and um, so I guess one, one last question, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I, I, my brain is going nonstop because uh, I geek out on this kind of stuff. Um, I'm curious about what happens to the camera footage. So first, are cameras actually recording whether or not people are uh, speeding through intersections? So the, the new intersection cameras will be able to do that. You'll remember about two years ago, state law, now allows intersection, they're called intersection safety devices to cite and record both speeding and red light running for intersections. None of our current intersection cameras can do that, but with the new contract and update of um, camera equipment, our intersection cameras will also be able to cite for when people are speeding through intersections. And uh, this is gonna be, we think an incredible safety tool for some of our highest crash locations, places where we've just consistently seen people running red lights, people going through at high speed and, and causing fatal and serious crashes. Uh, yes, uh, and what happens to the data 
all the film that's collected? Who gets it? Where is it stored? How long is it stored? What happens with it? I, you know, Clay, if you're on and you know the details, we have certain very specific requirements for storing images for a certain period of time based on our, our statutes. John, you might actually know the answer to this right off. Yeah, I do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, if there's a violation recorded, then... Please introduce yourself first, John, for the record. Oh, I, I apologize. My name is John Holbrook. I'm with the Portland Police Bureau Traffic Division. I supervise the photo enforcement program with the Police Bureau and also the uh, major crash team. Um, so if there's a violation recorded, then the images are kept for five years and then they're... Uh, if, there's, if there's no... Uh, violation recorded after 30 days, the images are are purged. So there's a very, you know, very limited and uh, tightly controlled uh, retention program for any images that are, are recorded. Thank you. I think that answers all the questions I had. I, I really appreciate uh, you, Dana and John, for um, answering my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Megan, were we able to get uh, Edith online? I think so. Let's try again. Edith? Can you hear me now? Yes. Well, I cannot talk about this contractor, and I have concerns about racial justice. I uh, took the PSU in Portland City traffic course, Teaching Best Practices, which involved integrated traffic, transportation, uh, engineering, education, and enforcement with zoning and permitting so people can live near their, where they work, uh, school, shop, worship, recreate, uh, providing, receive community services, and build community. One, increase the use of photographic traffic enforcement at high crash intersections and along high crash corridors especially the Oregon highways in Portland. I want to address uh, your concerns that you don't want to overburden certain neighborhoods. My former neighborhood was already long overburdened with crashes, injuries, deaths, and violent unjust policing and overpayments for insurance. It had the highest crash rates for the entire state of Oregon. Southeast 82nd, 92nd, Foster, Powell, and Division. Number two, outlaw police car chases and shooting from moving vehicles. And three, replace the Portland Police Bureau doing traffic stops. These three will reduce the deaths that we're trying to accomplish. This prevents or reduces the number and severity of crashes and collisions, property damage, injuries, um, disabilities, and deaths caused by civilian and police drivers. This reduces car and business insurance near and along these crash zones. I lived for years on Southeast 70th near Foster Road, from which I heard many times a night, every single night, ambulance sirens and sometimes crashes over 13, 15 blocks away. AMR routinely parked their ambulances at Foster near 80th to be close to the many injuries caused by car accidents on Foster Powell Division, 82nd, 92nd. While I had a cheap car, easy to repair, no comprehensive insurance, and no moving violations, and no at-fault accidents for decades. My insurance was higher because of bad policing and bad traffic enforcement in the area. That's another form of injustice. On my block, Portland police foolishly and excusably did a car chase crashing into a neighbor's stone wall, barely killing children playing nearby. And for years, we were traumatized by the unrepaired wall, reminding us they were always in danger by police who sped, ran lights, and drove illegally. Photo enforcement would also make it safer for our children who are harassed by Johns and endangered by Johns who are watching for cops and sex workers instead of pedestrians in crosswalks or red lights. This can reduce the shootings from cops, from road rage, and from people shooting cops in self-defense. I imagine it can save on lawsuits and save money in the long haul. Replace Many and prevent traffic stops by having the photo ID. Vote yes and expand it further with better engineering, better policing, better PBOT enforcement, and better education to public. Thank you for the first start. Thank you, Edith. Appreciate your testimony on this, Commissioner Hardesty. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, it just made me think of another question. Are we going to be collecting demographic information around how these cameras are impacting various communities? We still won't be able to have race data because it would be somebody sort of deciding the race of the person based on a photo image, and that has a lot of issues. But what we will have is more access to um, zip code information and other information that will tell us who's being cited. So we'll start to understand the impact of, a, you know, an example might be outer division. Um, are folks from the neighborhood getting cited more often or is it folks that are driving through that are actually being cited by that camera? So I think the answer is like, yes, we'll have more information and we'll be able to get it um, more easily. Um, but we still won't have specific um, race data from. I think we have an obligation to figure out how to collect data uh, based on race and ethnicity, because uh, at some point, either uh, when a citation is issued or when they show up in court uh, with the DA, there is a opportunity for us to gather that data. And I know the community will want that data. Uh, because we know the high crash areas are in areas with the most uh, people of color populations in the city of Portland. Um, and we also know that those are the people that are being really injured by uh, automobile violence in East Portland. And so I know I will need that information because my constituents will ask and I hope we figure out a way to start collecting it now. So a year from now, we're not wondering whether or not we've had an impact in a way that we want to have. So just kind of a, a, a putting your notice, I'm going to ask about that next year and hope that we figured it out uh, as we start launching this program. Yeah, there are a couple ways now that we can get some information um, through a traffic safety class. When people are a first time offender, we can collect race data there. But just thank you for your continued attention and focus on this. And, and we'll keep looking at all the different ways that we can continue to get better data. Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you, John. Thank you, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. We have a motion, can I get a second? Second. We have a second from Commissioner Ryan to Commissioner Hardesty's motion. Please call the roll. Ryan. Yes, um, well, thank you, Scott, Dana, John, and, and Edith for your testimony as well. Um, well, you kind of had me at getting better results for Vision Zero, and I appreciate the dialogue. I vote aye. Hardesty. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dana. Uh, thank you, John, for being here. And for all the folks who've worked on this, I know that we, I have been um, on PBOT ever since it became part of my portfolio. When are we gonna get these cameras? When are we gonna get these cameras? We gotta get these cameras. Um, but I'm also, I have moved significantly from hating cameras, wanting no part of cameras, to really understanding how in relationship with other safety improvements, they could help keep people in our communities safe. Um, but we need data to be able to prove that. Um, and I look forward to um, installing these cameras, installing the safety improvements so that uh, it doesn't matter what part of the city you live in, you can safely walk and bike in our streets. So I appreciate the work. I look forward to um, uh, uh, collecting the data and good results coming out of this work. I'm happy to vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The report is accepted. And last but not least, item 436 was also full. Amend grant agreement with the Portland African American Leadership Forum to add $130,000 to provide further support for community capacity building and community-led workshops. And uh, who pulled this? This item was pulled by Edith Gillis as well. All right, very good. Uh, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Uh, this amendment adds critical resources, $130,000 to support the community partners leading anti-displacement action plan development in collaboration with the city. The Anti-Displacement Coalition is a group of community-based organizations led by the most impacted and marginalized communities, organized to build shared power and advance racial, economic, and environmental justice, as well as health equity. 
This amendment provides resources to hire a much needed second organizer and resources for workshop implementation. The initial scope of work for this agreement created a primary organizer responsible for both capacity building within the coalition and coordination between BPS staff and the coalition. Given the impacts of COVID-19 and the fact that the community-based organizations working directly with frontline communities have had and will continue to have extremely limited capacity, BPS recognized that a second organizer would help add needed capacity to facilitate a division of roles. Financial support for the coalition helps ensure the workshops are community-led and that those contributing significantly to the effort are compensated for their time and expertise. BPS is committed to working with all bureaus and our communities to co-create an anti-displacement action plan to implement comprehensive policy, plan policies and coordinate city actions to promote equitable development and reduce the harmful impacts of displacement on residents, businesses, and cultural organi organizations. Support of this amendment is a critical step in advancing this very work. Katherine Hardinger and the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability is here to provide more background and answer questions about the work if needed. Should we should we have Edith testify just so we can understand what her questions are and that'll help focus this. So Edith, why don't you go ahead and, and give your testimony on this? I was just going to say an enthusiastic yes, yes, yes. Thank you and respectfully follow through with PAF's recommendations and city ordinances, policies, and practices. I want you to act on it and, uh, to, of course, not expand the I-5 pollution and harm to African-American communities. Also, publish historic and present-day experiences to educate and inspire whites to help them get freer from internalized settler colonial racism and strengthen our communities with justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion towards the much, much, much needed healing truth and conciliation. This will also reduce gun violence. Please vote yes. All right, uh, Edith, thank you for that. And um, just for future reference, these are already on the consent agenda, which means they are going to be uh, unanimously approved. And if they get pulled from the agenda, what happens is we have staff sitting around for an hour to an hour and a half waiting to answer potential questions. Um, so. Uh, in the future, feel free to just say, I'm, I'm all for it, congratulations, vote for it. Uh, but if you pull the item, uh, then we, we take steps to ensure that bureau leadership and staff members are present to be able to answer questions. Just you, you didn't have any reason to know that, but just FYI. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, first of all, I apologize. I, the police caused a brain injury. I don't, don't always think and remember well. But a second, I wanted to also have on the record more good reasons for doing things to support further growth. Um, so that can support more questioning, more research and more follow through than just a yes, no. Yeah, that, that's, um, that, that is a legitimate issue. And uh, thank you for noting that. Thank you. And, and, and I, cannot, I cannot email you because of the brain injuries to not look at screens. I'm sorry. Okay, fair, fair enough. Thank you, Edith. We appreciate your testimony. Uh, this is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Brian. Aye. Artisty. Um, thank you, Commissioner Rubio. I love when we keep our commitment that we're going to invest in communities so they can help us reach our climate change goals. Um, and um, I am I'm, uh, around displacement and ensuring that we are not continuing to displace people as we continue to uh, uh, address the challenges ahead. I'm happy to vote aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. I wanna thank the Anti-Displacement Coalition for all their good work. And I'm looking forward to uh, continuing this partnership. I vote aye. Wheeler. I vote aye. Excellent. The ordinance is adopted, approved, and we are adjourned until 2 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Recording stopped.